O eternal and almighty God, from whom all power and wisdom come, we are assembled here before thee to frame such laws as may tend to the welfare and prosperity of our province. Grant, O merciful God, we pray thee, that we may desire only that which is in accordance with thy will, that we may seek it with wisdom and know it with certainty and accomplish it perfectly. For the glory and honor of thy name and for the welfare of all our people. Amen. We acknowledge we are gathered on Treaty 1 territory and that Manitoba is located on the treaty territories and ancestral lands of the Anishinaabe, Anish in Inuak, Dakota Oate, Dene Suline, and Nihithoag nations. We acknowledge Manitoba is located on the homeland of the Red River Metis. We acknowledge Northern Manitoba includes lands that were and are the ancestral lands of the Inuit. We respect the spirit and intent of treaties and treaty making and remain committed to working in partnership with First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people in the spirit of truth, reconciliation, and collaboration. Good afternoon, everybody. Please be seated. Routine proceedings, introduction of bills. The Honourable Member for River Heights. Uh, Madam Speaker, I move seconded by the MLA for Tyndall Park that Bill Number 238 the Personal Care Home Accountability Act, various acts amended, le loi sur la responsabilisation des foyers de soins personnels, modification de diverses lois, be now read a first time. It has been moved by the Honourable Member for River Heights, seconded by the Honourable Member for Tyndall Park, that Bill Number 238, the Personal Care Home Accountability Act, various acts amended, be now read a first time. The Honourable Member for River Heights. Yeah. Madam Speaker, uh, Bill 238, the Personal Care Homes Accountability Act, will help to facilitate the establishment of family councils at each individual personal care home. Family councils not only create an additional level of accountability, but also a support network and a forum to help families transitioning their loved ones to personal care. This act also requires specific information to be reported and made available to the public to shed a greater level of transparency at each care home in Manitoba. I look forward to support from the House. Thank you. Is it the pleasure of the House to adopt the motion? Agreed? Agreed and so ordered. Committee reports, tabling of reports, ministerial statements, members' statements. The honourable member for, or the honourable minister of seniors and long-term care. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I'm always humbled by the accomplishments of the many outstanding individuals in my community. Christy Meek, the executive director and president of the Assiniboia Chamber of Commerce is one such individual. Since 2018, Christy has gone over and above providing information and services to more than 400 businesses in the St. James Assiniboia area. This has been through hosting multiple community and networking events with business leaders and stakeholders. Christy takes a great deal of pride in how she uh, and the Chamber brings West Winnipeg leaders together. They are currently working on new events for 2024, demonstrating their shared passion and common bonds. Christy tells me she is all about walking the walk than talking the talk and being engaged in our community. If there is a barbecue, she is flipping dogs on the grill while still talking about community and building connections. In February, Christy was invited to join the Council of Women's Advocacy. This council brings the voice and perspective of women to national policies. Christy has also opened the Chamber office to internships, such as places, to places such as Red River College and the University of Winnipeg. These internships have helped shape graphic design, HR, and project management. Madam Speaker, I ask my colleagues to rise and thank Christy Meek for her commitment to the community, the city, and the province of Manitoba.
The Honorable Member for Notre Dame. Our province is facing an alarming physician shortage. We have the lowest number of family physicians per capita in Canada, the third lowest for specialist physicians. This shortage will get worse as many physicians retire or leave the province. We have 68 hospitals in rural and northern communities, but only 27 of those emergency rooms are open all day and night. Meanwhile, 23 ERs operate with reduced hours, and 18 ERs have been closed for more than a year and are not expected to reopen at all. This is the Pallister Stephenson government's damning record on rural ERs to date. Recently, I met with many Manitobans who are international medical graduates, IMGs, that want to be part of the solution. IMG suggests that from the very beginning, as immigrants pre and post arrival, there should be orientation supports tailored to health professionals. IMG suggests that the government reduce costs or offer student loans. Many IMGs defer their accreditation exams because they can't afford the exams and need to work survival jobs to support their families. The longer IMGs are out of clinical practice, the harder it will be for them to become accredited as doctors. This BC government should further increase residency training spots for IMGs and domestic medical graduates. And these resident spots should prioritize Manitobans, similar to the Alberta system. IMGs also request that the government introduces a mentorship program, similar to the observership program in BC, that allows applicants to job shadow physicians. Also, IMGs have requested that physician's assistant program requirements be reassessed to ensure fairness. Manitoba international Medi medical graduates should be part of the solution to our doctor shortage across rural and northern Manitoba, but instead they face underemployment and work as health care aides or call center agents. I'm calling on the PC government to make IMGs be an integral part of our province's health human resource strategy. Thank you, Madam Speaker. <laughs> The Honorable Minister of Natural Resources and Northern Development. Madam Speaker, today, April 17th, we celebrate Community Newspaper Day in Manitoba, honoring the vital role that local newspapers play in our province's communities. In 2005, Mavis Tayo, the former MLA for Morris, received unanimous support from all members of this House for her resolution, recognizing the significance of community newspapers in Manitoba. Eighteen years later, our province is home to 30 community newspapers, each of them dedicated to chronicling the stories of the communities they serve. Every week, these newspapers deliver nearly 368,000 copies across Manitoba. In an age where distinguishing real news from fake news can be challenging, community newspapers remain a reliable source of information. They document the lives and activities of Manitobans through both words and images, acting as living history books and providing relevant news to their readers. The printed community newspaper is by far the favourite source of local news and information in communities large and small across Canada. Three quarters of Canadians in non-urban centres read a community newspaper. While the predominant reason for reading printed community newspapers is local information including news, opinions, sports, entertainment and events, studies have revealed that community newspapers rank as the number one media source for government advertising, covering everything from public notices to information on provincial government programmes important to taxpayers. The oldest newspaper in Western Canada, the Minnedosa Tribune, which I'm proud to say is one of three newspapers owned by my son Ryan, is celebrating its 140th anniversary this year. In many communities across the province, the local newspaper remains the oldest and longest running business. Madam Speaker, for most community newspapers, today is a very busy day in their weekly schedule, so publishers were unable to join us today. However, I would like to ask all members of the House to join me in expressing our gratitude for their dedication to their communities and wishing them continued success as they celebrate Community Newspaper Day in Manitoba. The Honourable Member for Elmwood. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. Every Manitoban with a family member in a long-term care or receiving home care can personally attest to the terrible decline in our health care system over the last seven years. Manitoba seniors have borne the brunt of this decline by paying a heavy personal price because of PC budget cuts since 2016. Back then, this PC government promised to build 1,200 new personal care home beds. Yet by the summer of 2022, there were 193 fewer beds in Manitoba than when they took office. In rural Manitoba, fewer beds meant too many new placements far away from their home communities. 
The Roblin Review recently wrote about Lorena Ward, a 90-year-old for Roblin who was placed in a personal care home in faraway Shoal Lake, where she had no family or friends. The mother of an Elmwood resident was forced to move from the Gimli Hospital to Arborg and then to St. Rose de Lac in the middle of winter when it was extremely difficult for her children to visit from Winnipeg. This is the same government that failed to shore up personal care home defenses before the second wave of COVID arrived. Day after day, COVID deaths on cruise ships, retirement homes filled the news. Seniors in retirement homes from Italy to New York. Our West Coast and other heavily populated areas were at heightened risk. So why this government felt it unnecessary to take reasonable and obvious steps to protect our Manitoba seniors is a mystery. That's why Manitoba ranked the highest deaths per capita in the country in personal care and retirement homes. Madam Speaker, Manitobans deserve better. They will hold this government accountable for these seven long years of neglect. The Honourable Minister of Consumer Protection and Government Services. Tonight at sunset, Yom HaShoah begins. Yom HaShoah is Holocaust Remembrance Day. This is a day dedicated to the memories of the lives lost during the Second World War. Millions of Jewish men, women, and children were killed in extermination camps, shot by death squads, or perished from starvation or disease in concentration camps. And millions more died throughout the war, whether as soldiers in armed conflict, citizens engaged in acts of resistance, or as innocent victims of bombings, disease, or starvation. We must never forget and tonight is another opportunity to remember. Let this day help us to remember that the worst human rights violations often come by denying the humanity of those discriminated against. The Nazi government labeled Jews, Roma, people of color, and those with physical and mental disabilities as Untermenschen, subhumans. They used that label to justify murder. Throughout history, similar logic has been used to perpetuate the slave trade, deny, human, or deny women's rights, and more. Human rights should always be respected by governments, by courts, and by all. And while for some, these tragedies may seem distant, for me, this remembrance is very personal. I remember that my maternal grandfather spent most of the Second World War in a Nazi concentration camp. I remember that my mother, only a youngster at the time, helped keep her family alive while nearly starving to death herself. I remember that my father lived daily with the knowledge that he and his Dutch parents and their siblings could be shot and killed at any time if the Jewish toddler that they were harboring was found. Therefore, I resolve to follow my grandparents' example. I resolve to resist evil. I resolve to stand for justice and mercy. I resolve to be willing to do so, even if it means that I suffer or even die as a result. We should all resolve to do the same. We have some guests in the gallery that I would like to introduce to you. Seated in the public gallery from Crystal Creek School, we have seven, seven students under the direction of Tim Reimer. And this group is located in the constituency of the Honorable Member for Turtle Mountain. On behalf of all members here, we welcome you to the Manitoba Legislature. Oral questions, the Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Seven thousand frontline healthcare professionals have voted in favour of a strike. This is an unprecedented mandate, and it's a clear sign that they've had enough of this PC government. They've had enough of a five-year wage freeze, enough of disrespect from Brian Pallister and now the Stephenson government. Why has the government forced allied health care workers to vote in favour of a strike? The Honourable Deputy Premier. Well, thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. We certainly value the uh, work that our frontline workers do uh, across our great province, uh, Madam Speaker. Uh, clearly, the government of Manitoba is, is not the employer in this particular situation. 
Uh, we know there's discussions going on at the bargaining table between the employer, uh, shared health, and the union membership as well. Uh, there's a collective uh, bargaining uh, process in place. Uh, we respect uh, the collective bargaining process. I'm not sure what the opposition NDP would like us to do. Do they want us to go and interfere with that collective bargaining process? The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition on a supplementary question. Everyone in Manitoba knows that the PC government does not respect collective bargaining. And everyone in Manitoba knows that they have made a mess of our provincial health care system. Allied health care workers have gone five long years without a contract. That means these paramedics in rural Manitoba, these lab techs and x-ray techs, respiratory therapists and other allied health professionals have had their wages frozen for five years. That's during a cost of living crisis. That's why 99% of these 7,000 health care workers have voted to strike. Will the Premier give allied health care workers a fair deal today? The Honourable Deputy Premier. Well, Madam Speaker, we know the NDP record when it comes to rural health care. Uh, that uh, when they were in government closed close to 20 emergency rooms on a permanent basis, Madam Speaker. That is the NDP record. Madam Speaker, we recognize uh, the health care workers, the frontline workers. Uh, that's why we've increased our budget to health this year alone, 9.2%, uh, Madam Speaker. $668 million in health care, Madam Speaker. That will go towards supporting wages for our frontline workers. Madam Speaker, we respect the workers and we respect the collective bargaining process now underway. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition on a final supplementary. The PCs are always trying to change the channel from their failure on our health care system. We know that right now in Manitoba, one of the biggest crises that's unfolding under their watch is this strike vote that's taken place by allied health care professionals. And who can blame them? If you live in rural Manitoba, we're talking about the rural paramedics. These are the folks who've had to vote in favour of a strike because they've had their wages frozen for five years. A wage freeze for five years during a cost of living crisis. That's the policy of this PC government. Yep. On this side of the House, we respect allied health care right. professionals. Right. Why has this PC government <coughs> failed to give them a fair deal? Uh, the Honourable Deputy Premier. Well, Madam Speaker, we've increased uh, health care spending by 22 per cent since we came into office. Uh, this budget actually provided all working Manitobans a tax relief when it comes to income tax. NDP voted against it, Madam Speaker. We've also committed $200 million to retain and train and attract new people to Manitoba in the health care field, Madam Speaker. Money that that opposition voted against. We respect, we respect frontline workers and we respect the collective bargaining process. Clearly, the NDP don't. The Honourable Member of the uh, Official Op the Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition on a new question. These are just more attempts by this PC government to try and distract from their failures on health care. The rural paramedics have voted to strike. And this past December, there were zero applicants for the new advanced care paramedic course at Red River College. The reason why no one applied is because they know that if they complete the program, their wages will be frozen by this PC government. No one applied because they don't want to learn skills that they won't be allowed to practice at the bedside by this PC government. This is one of the leading causes for the long wait times for rural EMS. Why has this PC government, the Stephenson government, continued to disrespect rural paramedics? The Honourable Deputy Premier. Well, Madam Speaker, uh, the Leader of the Opposition is completely wrong. In fact, we respect uh, paramedics and the work they do. Uh, in fact, we gave them the authority to actually self-regulate their own profession, something the NDP had 17 years to do, never did it. That's why we, on this side of the House, respect the work of paramedics. That's why we're actively negotiating, that Shared Health is actively negotiating a contract, what I think will be a fair and reasonable contract for paramedics right across Manitoba. The 
The Honorable Leader of the Official Opposition on a supplementary question. I want to thank the Deputy Premier for finally confirming that it is his government that's yeah. negotiating with we, these paramedics. We, yeah. But I do want to remind everyone in Manitoba that these rural paramedics and all the other allied health care professionals have had their wages frozen for five years. Imagine the impact of a one-year wage freeze during this current time of inflation, and then now expand that back into five years of PC cuts. That's led to frustration. That's led to burnout. That's led to paramedics, lab techs, and other health care professionals leaving our province because of Brian Pallister and the Stephenson government. Yeah. Why has the PC government continued to disrespect rural paramedics and other health care professionals? The Honourable Deputy Premier. Well, Madam Speaker, the member of the opposition has it completely wrong again. We fully respect the work they do for Manitobans each and every day. We recognize the staffing challenges that we have in Manitoba, and it's certainly not unique to Manitoba. We're f every jurisdiction in the country is facing staffing challenges. That's why we've committed $200 million to attract 2,000 new people to health care in Manitoba. In this year's budget alone, $123 million to retain, train, and attract new people here to Manitoba, and the NDP voted against that. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition on a final supplementary. Madam Speaker, what is unique to Manitoba is that we've had worse health care outcomes in this province because of the cuts of Brian Pallister and the Stephenson government. Manitobans know that you just can't trust the PCs when it comes to health care. Manitobans know that this PC government, this Stephenson government, is not all of a sudden going to fix the damage that they themselves have caused to our health care system. Only the Manitoba NDP can fix health care. It starts with our plan for rural health care, which we look forward to unveiling on May 1st in Verdon, Manitoba. Why has the PC government disrespected rural paramedics for so long? The Honourable Deputy Premier. Well, Madam Speaker, I can see where this is headed. And the NDP made promises a number of years ago. Wasn't that the $15 million to end hallway medicine? That was the promise they made then. They never did it. In fact, under their watch, they closed 18 emergency rooms permanently in rural Manitoba. Yeah. Madam Speaker, we respect the bargaining operations under the collective agreement process. We respect the workers. Under the NDP government, Negotiations and collective bargaining were done through the Premier's office. That's not the way to do business. The Honourable Member for Union Station. Madam Speaker, Manitobans know that when it comes to health care, the Stephenson PC government can simply not be trusted. Because of the decisions that this government has made, our to our health care system and the cuts that they've been making since 2016, our health care system is in chaos. We have a shortage of over 400 doctors, and yet this government cut the physician retention and recruitment fund. Will this Premier acknowledge that their failure to enhance physician training over the past seven years has left Manitobans behind? The Honourable Minister of Health. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I want Manitobans to know that the opposition and the NDP cannot be trusted because they are out of touch with what Manitobans are thinking, what their needs are, and they're out of touch with what is happening in the province as well. Madam Speaker, the member for St. Vitale took to social media this weekend, and I'll table his social media post, to say that the Manitoba government had done nothing to increase physician training seats here in the province. I also want to table two months before that tweet, we announced the increase of physician training seats, Madam Speaker, but they're out of touch with what is happening in our province. I also want them to know that on Friday, our government, Shared Health, released a request for proposal to add the 150 time has positions. The 
the Honourable Member for Union Station on a supplementary question. Madam Speaker, we know that uh, their party membership is so embarrassed by the state of health care in this province, thanks to their decision making, that they kept their main policy discussion a secret and had that discussion behind closed doors at their own AGM. There's no wonder why Manitobans don't trust this government and are done waiting for the PCs to do the right thing. Patients are left waiting and waiting and waiting while this Premier decides to freeze retention funds for yet another year. When will this PC government finally do the right thing, admit they were wrong, reinstate the funding for doctor recruitment and retention incentives in Manitoba? Order. The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, Madam Speaker. When the request for proposal went live on Friday, the members opposite missed it because they were sitting around a table with the Leader of the Opposition deciding which of the 18,000 employees and programs at Shared Health they would cut as part of their election platform, Madam Speaker. I want to table the request for proposal that they missed on Friday that will allow for 50 family physicians to be recruited to northern Manitoba, 50 for rural Manitoba, and 50 for Winnipeg. I'm just bringing them up to speed on what is happening in the province where they live. The Honourable Member for Union Station on a final supplementary. Madam Speaker, Doctors Manitoba has stated their disappointment with this PC government budget, which completely ignores the physician shortage in our province. After years of cuts, interference and indifference from this PC government, the University of Manitoba is considering proposal proposals to increase training spaces and medical residencies. But it takes seven years to train doctors and even longer, Madam Speaker, for specialists who are in short supply. Will this minister finally admit that their failure to act means Manitoba is further behind when it comes to increasing any homegrown doctors? And I'll remind the minister that we have a shortage of over 400 physicians in our province, the worst across the country. Is she going to do something about it? The Honourable Minister of Health. Madam Speaker, I tabled the RFP and I encourage the member for Union Station to have a read. Madam Speaker, in March, uh, Doctors Manitoba applauded our government for removing unnecessary red tape and examinations that prevented physicians from being licensed here in the province, something they never did, Madam Speaker. And they said this is one of the many, many actions needed to address Manitoba's doctor shortage. We hope to see more actions, and we applaud the province for the steps they have taken. That is a fact, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member for Transcona. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. While they try their hardest to distract and deflect in this house all day and every day, education funding has continued to trend downwards. River East Transcona School Division has been forced to cut 13 library staff called library technicians, Madam Speaker, a very specialized program. Pembina Trails had to eliminate their full day kindergarten program, Madam Speaker, and now we've learned that two school divisions are cutting their international baccalaureate program. These cuts hurt kids, they hurt families, they hurt communities. Can the minister, Madam Speaker, explain, does he think schools should be forced to cut programs such as international baccalaureate just to keep the lights on? Yeah. The Honourable Minister of Education and Early Childhood Learning. Madam Speaker, the member knows this year alone $100 million more to the K-12 education funding. That's, Madam Speaker, that's a 6.8% increase. 6.8% increase, Madam Speaker. To the, to the member 
uh, making comments in regards to River East Transcona School Division, Madam Speaker. Order. They've received an $11 million increase wow. this wow. year alone, Madam Speaker. Wow. It's unfortunate more. that the member opposite wants us to interfere with the democratic rights of the elected officials of the school boards in this province of ours, Madam Speaker. I wish he'd stand up and say so today, Madam Speaker. Order. The Honourable Member for Transcona on a supplementary question. Oh, thank you, Madam Speaker. What they want is a real partner at the table. That's right. Not somebody that continually cuts programming yeah. and then says they're increasing. Yeah. It's not one that says they're going to bring a couple pails of water to a fire they started seven years ago. That's right. And we're starting to see the results of this, Madam Speaker. Cuts, cuts, and more cuts that are hurting our kids, families, and communities. That's a fact. I have yet to see a school board line up outside the office and thanking this yeah, minister and his government not for one. what they've been doing for schools. So I'll ask again, will the premier do the right thing and finally stop cutting education and fund it to the level that it needs to be at? Yeah, right the Honourable Minister of Education and Early Childhood Learning. Again, uh, Madam Speaker, it's unfortunate that this member an educator himself would stand up in this house and continue to fear monger yep. not only Manitobans, Madam Speaker, but those great students and those individuals that we're trying to make sure that they are receiving consistent increased funding year after year, Madam Speaker. That's what we're doing on this side of the house. $100 million this year alone, 6.8% increase. The member knows that over since 2016, Madam Speaker, it's a 23% increase to the K-12 education system right here in this great province of ours, Madam Speaker. We're going to make sure that students succeed no matter where they live in this great province of ours, their cultural background, or their own personal circumstance, Madam Speaker. The Honourable, Minister, the Honourable Member for Transcona on a final supplementary. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. I know it's pretty tough for the minister. And I have some empathy for him. He's got a former Minister of Education at the end here that cut the Education mm -hmm. Library. Another former Minister of Education introduced mm -hmm. Bill 64. A Premier that seconded Bill 64. Yep. And then, Madam Speaker, he was forced to write an article that supported Bill 64. Yeah. So this is what we get from this PC government, yeah. right? Anything. More distraction and more defection. So I'll ask one more time, will the Premier finally do the right thing and commit to stop cutting education? Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. The Honourable Minister of Education and Early Childhood Learning. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. And I, I, uh, I thank the member for Concordia, just reminding the House that this year's alone $100 million, 6.8% increase, is an astronomical increase to educational funding Thanks, in the province of Manitoba. Thanks for reminding us that. Thanks, Matt. This year alone, $206 million, $100 million in to P-12, plus $106 million, which we've annualized each and every year, Madam Speaker. Not, never mind the $17 million this year alone, in the last three years, for sp students with special needs, Madam right, Speaker. Right. We're making sure that we're funding students who are desperately yeah, needing the funding in this right. great province of ours, Madam Speaker, right. while the they vote time against has it. Expired. The Honourable Member for Wolseley. Thank you, Madam Speaker. On this side of the House, we stand against the privatization of liquor in Manitoba. And that is why I was happy to announce earlier today that we will be delaying Bill 9 and Bill 30. These, these bills would have made our communities less safe Order. and would move the public benefit into private hands. They would have increased the risk of liquor being sold to minors and the numbers of thefts and robberies. And that is the wrong Order. approach. Will the minister stand in his place and admit that privatizing liquor in Manitoba is the wrong approach?
the Honourable Minister of Municipal Relations. Well, Madam Speaker, I always appreciate any time I get to speak about the great things our government wants to do That's right. to, to make sure that our uh, liquor retail system is modernized, yep. it is more convenient, and we balance that with the needs of security. Right. I guess members opposite are a little confused that they be, they're forgetting that it's the year 2023, not the year 1923. The years of prohibition are long over. Here, here. The Honourable Member for Wolseley, order. Madam Speaker. Order. The Minister. The order. Sorry. The Honourable Member for Wolseley on a supplementary question. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Minister conveniently ignores that over 89% of Manitobans have expressed that they are very satisfied with our public liquor system. And unlike the PCs, we understand the value of a public liquor system and the need to balance convenience with public safety. We know you can't improve a system by tearing it down. We should be improving our public system, not giving handouts to private companies. And that is why Bill 9 and Bill 30 are the wrong approach. Will the minister commit to withdrawing Bills 9 and 30 today? The Honourable Minister for Municipal Relations. Madam Speaker. Our government is committed to making sure that we modernize the liquor retail system and catching up with the 21st century, Madam Speaker. I know members opposite are still stuck in the days of prohibition, but we in the side of the House stand up for Manitobans. We want to make sure that Manitobans have an opportunity to have more convenience. We want to make sure that they have the ability to invest and reinvest in our economy, Madam Speaker, and balancing that with the needs of security. We on this side of the House stand with good, hardworking Manitobans. I'm not sure why they don't want to modernize our liquor system. The Honourable Member for Wolsey on a final supplementary. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Unlike the PCs, we recognize and respect the value of our public system. Liquor sales generate hundreds of millions of dollars that go into healthcare, education, addiction services, and more. And instead of supporting our public system, the PCs are trying to tear it down through Bills 9 and Bill 30. This is yet another continuation of failed PC Premier Brian Pallister's agenda, and that's why we're happy to announce that we've delayed Bills 9 and 30. Will the minister get on board and commit to stop trying to privatize liquor sales in Manitoba yeah, today? The Honourable Minister for Municipal Relations. Madam Speaker, I'll remind the members opposite that this side of the House, we want to modernize the liquor retail system. We want to make it more convenient for Manitobans. We want to create more economic opportunities for Manitobans while balancing that with security. I know members opposite wax and wane poetically about security, but that's the same party that doesn't even believe that drunk driving is a crime, Madam Speaker. On this side of the House, we stand with good, hardworking Manitobans. They stand with drunk drivers. The Honourable Member for Concordia. Madam Speaker, the PCs have disrespected health care workers in Manitoba. They fired nurses, forced them to work overtime while severely short-staffed, cut their budgets and caused chaos across our health care system. And now they've failed to hire any institutional safety officers to keep them safe at their workplaces. It's clear that our frontline health care workers are not a priority of this PC government. Can the Minister explain why the Stephenson government is not prioritizing the safety of Manitoba's health care workers? Good question. The Honourable Minister of Justice. Thank you, Madam Speaker. We developed the Institutional Safety Officer Program. We've had training that's ongoing. We've had ISOs that have graduated. In fact, they might be working 
already. We ensured that the Community Safety Officer Program was developed. We're strengthening with legislation that's before the legislature right now. We've worked with the RCMP. We've worked with the Winnipeg Police Service to have integrated units to go after gang members. The only thing that these three things all have in common, other than our support, is the fact that the NDP voted against all of them, Madam Speaker. Oh. Order. <laughs> the Honourable Member for Concordia on a supplementary question. Madam Speaker, for seven years the PCs have disrespected our frontline health care workers. Yep, they failed to increase staffing, forced them to work long overtime, and now they've even failed to hire a single institutional safety officer at a health care facility. This is despite promising them and passing it in this House in 2019. Nurses are speaking out, Madam Speaker. They're saying that they don't feel safe even walking to their cars. Institutional safety officers could help increase safety. Can the minister just explain why the PC government has failed to establish even a single institutional safety officer at a health care facility in Manitoba? Good question. The Honourable Minister of Justice. The program was developed. Uh, individuals have uh, been trained, they've been graduated, there's some are already working in the province of Manitoba, uh, Madam Speaker. But what's also clear is that this is a government that stands with police officers and that stands with law enforcement. We've been working with law enforcement to develop a number of different action plans, whether it's community safety officers, whether it is those integrated units to go after those who are committing harm in our society. We continue to provide additional funding. There was a member in this House who said that the police don't need any more money, and that was the member for St. John's. Oh. <laughs> Order. The Honourable Member for Concordia on a final supplementary. Once again, more words from this minister and yet no action from this minister. Since 2019, the PCs have promised over and over again that they'll establish the institutional safety officers at our health care facilities. It's 2023, Madam Speaker. It's abundantly clear by now that the PCs will say anything in an election year to get re-elected, but they'll continue to break this promise to our frontline health care workers. And it's clear why. They have disrespected them at every step of the way. So why should we expect it would be any different now? Can the minister just explain why his government continues to disrespect health care workers and won't bring in the institutional safety officer program and hire them at our health care facilities? The Honourable Minister of Justice. The program was uh, brought in, developed, and individuals have been trained and graduated already, Madam Speaker. But maybe the member opposite can explain why it is that he sits beside an individual who says the police don't need any more funding, wow. even though we know that there is a need for more coordinated policing, which requires more money. Maybe he could turn behind him and speak to the individual who said that the police were wrong when the police asked for bail reform, when the police across Canada said, we need bail reform, and yet the member opposite who sits behind him went on to Twitter and said, well, he deleted the tweet, of course, but he did go on to Twitter and said that there shouldn't be bail reform. Twitter, Hansard, these aren't things that are written in disappearing ink. They stay there, Manitobans know, and we'll remind them, we stand with the police, we defend them, they defund them, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member for St. Boniface. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Last Friday, I met with residents of 101 Mary Order. in St. Boniface, who are once again facing challenges since the Minister's visit last year in July. There are still very serious issues with security, with people who are experiencing homelessness and addictions entering the building, as well as people bringing in furniture infested with bedbugs and cockroaches. 
Proper security could prevent it because it's contributing to an endless infestation, continual spraying with chemicals, and residents have chronic health conditions. There used to be 24-7 security at 101 Marion and better security at many other Manitoba, uh, Manitoba, housing, Manitoba housing uh, buildings. Will the government bring it back and make sure these folks who live there can feel safe in their own home? The Honourable Minister of Families. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. And I do recognize that there are challenges at 101 Marion for the residents who live there with security. That is why our government had made uh, investments last year, an additional $4 million in security so that we could have additional security personnel at all of our Manitoba housing properties. It's very unfortunate that members opposite decided to vote against that commitment to enhance security in all Manitoba housing complexes. Yeah, The Honourable Member for St. Boniface on a supplementary question. Thank you, Madam Speaker. There are other buildings where insect infestations have been eradicated, but the folks of 101 Marion are having to live with endless spraying because the problem isn't being resolved. Many residents of 101 Marion are seniors with chronic health conditions, including trouble breathing. They may be allergic to the insects, irritated by the chemicals, and when they have to leave during the treatment, they have no place to go. So some residents who, without insects who don't want spraying, when they refuse, are being given eviction notices. This includes folks who will be kicked out this week unless it's overturned. Will the minister put a halt to these evictions for seniors with disabilities and consider providing them with a place to stay while their units are properly treated? The Honourable Home Minister of Families. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker, and I appreciate members opposite bringing this to my attention, and of course I will certainly look into this. Our government believes in ensuring that everybody in Manitoba has a safe and affordable place to call home. That is why we announced our $126 million homelessness strategy earlier this year, and that is why within that strategy there's a specific budget dedicated to supporting those who have chronic infestations to help them to uh, have their places cleaned and help them relocate temporarily while their, their apartments are undergoing uh, measures to uh, get rid of the in insect. So we are committed to uh, ensuring that all residents can work through these challenging uh, situations, and I'm committed to helping address this at 101 Marion. The Honourable Member for River Heights on a final supplementary. Uh, Madam Speaker, personal care homes are places where uh, individuals should be able to live with dignity and with respect and where they can receive the support that they need to live. Numerous concerns about the care provided in certain of Manitoba's personal care homes have arisen. Families have an important role to ensure optimum care for their loved ones. And this role is greater when their loved one has dementia. Will the minister support the bill that I table today to provide for family councils in personal care homes to provide accountability, support, and a forum to discuss the concerns that they have. The Honourable Minister for Seniors and Long-Term Care. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. And uh, I can indicate uh, to the member that uh, this department is constant uh, communication uh, with the stakeholders who who uh, work with uh, different families and different individuals in regards to fulfilling uh, their needs, and there's certainly an open liaison there. Uh, in regards to the personal care home uh, challenges that uh, the member indicates, uh, that's one of the reasons why this government initiated the Stevenson Review. And coming out of the Stevenson Review were a number of recommendations uh, which this government is committed to adopting. The Honourable Member for Brandon East. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Keystone Centre, which is located in Brandon, is definitely a unique multifunctional facility that hosts a, a variety of local, provincial, national, and international events sure. that contribute to the social, recreational, cultural, and agricultural fabric of our region. It is home to the Brandon Weekings of the Western Hockey League and hosts the annual uh, Royal Manitoba Winter Fair. It also contributes millions of dollars in annual economic activity for the entire province. Yeah. I know that they recently received funding through the ACSC uh, fund, and I asked the Minister of Sport, Culture and Heritage if he could speak more on this amazing initiative. Very good question. The Honourable Minister for Sport, Culture and Heritage. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I would like to thank the member for Brandon East for that great question and all the work he's doing out there. 
Madam Speaker, our government is proud to invest in stronger communities by supporting services, businesses, and infrastructure like the Keystone Centre. Recently, they were awarded $3 million through our ACSE fund towards upgrades at the main area at the Keystone Centre. Additionally, the Manitoba government also provided $7.9 million in operating and capital support. That's a total of $15.9 dollars for a five-year funding agreement between Manitoba government, Keystone Centre and the City of Brandon. Madam Speaker, unlike the NDP that did nothing for arts, sports and culture for 17 years, our government is getting, some, getting things done with a $100 million investment in this sector alone. Member for the Park Cami Sack. The Honourable Member for the Park Cami Sack. Madam Speaker, can you ask for ten? Three times already, including in this session, our party has put forward amendments that would provide guaranteed paid leave while families are grieving their losses. Extra time to grieve is important, but it's only one step. Now that we have all taken this first step in extending this important leave, will this PC government? Call Bill 210 to committee. The Honourable Minister for Labour and Immigration. Everybody thank you, Madam Speaker. I'd like to thank the member from Rossbeard and the PAW for bringing up for this important bill for making amendments to the Employment Standards Code to include a leave for miscarriages or stillbirths. The Employment Standards Code uh, defines several protected leaves that an employee in Manitoba affected by a miscarriage or stillbirth may use, depending on the circumstances. We will consult with the department, department stakeholders and Manitobas as we proceed with this legislation. The Honourable Member for the Park Amisak on a supplementary question. Madam Speaker, can you ask who the estimates that are The estimates are that one in five pregnancies end in miscarriage. Extending paid leave for miscarriages and stillbirths is just the right thing to do. After seven years of inaction of this PC government, grieving families need us to act and to support them. Financial, financial considerations for link, low income and regular families struggling with increased costs should not limit whether they can take full leave that will now be allowed. Both Bill 210 and Bill 235 have passed second reading. So will this government call them both to committee? The Honourable Minister of Labour. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Beyond the minimum requirements of the code, employers currently have the option to provide paid or unpaid leave to, employ to an employee facing difficult circumstances, including miscarriage or a stillbirth. The Department of Labour hosts many consultations with the representatives of Labour and Employer Council on many important issues, such as this legislation, and we'll further action based on this, uh, the recommendations from the stakeholders. The Honourable Member for the Paul Kamisak on a final supplementary. Thank you, Madam Speaker. All we get is excuses from the Labour Minister and this PC government. Under the PC government's approach, many parents will have to choose between grieving their loss or putting food on the table. This is an impossible choice for many and can lead to longer-term trauma if parents aren't given time to grieve. Will this PC government do the right thing today and support our bill to provide paid leave for families that have experienced a pregnancy loss. Egerson. The Honourable Minister of Justice. Uh, I think, Madam Speaker, this is one of those moments of the legislature where all members can take pride of the work that has been done across party uh, divides. Uh, it's not a political issue. The member for the PAW has a bill. The member for Rossmere uh, has a bill. Both would provide support for those who have suffered a miscarriage, and I've spoken about my own family's experience with miscarriages. I think we need to put aside the political bickering on this particular issue, know that there will be a, a bill, a private member's bill, dealing with bereavement called before the committee, uh, before the session ends, and the members will have an opportunity to put a vote to that. I think all of us should take pride in that fact. The Honourable Member for Flin Flon. Madam Speaker, Brian Pallister may be gone, but that tall, dark shadow remains, and the Stephenson government refused to support 
new policies, they still follow Brian Pallister's policies. Over 20% conservation officer positions remain empty, despite this minister and this government promising to fix the problem. In neighboring Saskatchewan, CEOs are paid 30% more than they are here in Manitoba. Again, this minister, this government are failing Manitobans. When will this PC government realize that paying competitive wages is integral to recruitment? And will the minister commit to getting enough CEOs and paying them properly today? The Honourable Minister for Natural Resources and Northern Development. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. When it comes to supporting conservation officers, the NDP will all, all bark and no bite. Yeah. Manitobans deserve a government that will provide the resources and the funding necessary to keep our wildlife communities safe. Manitobans know they only have one choice, and our government is committing to reversing the damage the NDP did to our conservation officers' service. We know it's a critical part of our government commitment to enforcing the rule of law in Manitoba. Yeah. Yeah. Time for oral questions has expired. Petitions. The Honourable Member for River Heights. Uh, Madam Speaker, I wish to present the following petition to the Legislative Assembly. The background to this petition is as follows. Individuals with executive function disorders, usually associated with the learning disability, ADHD or autism, have a specific deficiency in the executive or adaptive fu function of their brain. Individuals with executive function disorders can have a high IQ and can in some instances speak as eloquently as a university professor, but often are unable to plan and organize their lives, manage their meals, housing, or finances. Some individuals have an executive function disability in which their executive function develops slowly, requiring that they receive help and support for five to ten years after they turn 18 years old. Many individuals with executive function disorders can do well in life and at work if given adequate supports and the chance to fully develop their executive function capabilities. Without that support, they risk becoming homeless, face inconsistent employment, and or could be the victims or perpetrators of crime. Manitoba has few limited resources specifically to help those with executive function disorders. We petition the Legislative Assembly of Manitoba as follows to urge the provincial government to partner with organizations that provide individual and group supports and online resources for children and adults with executive function disorders and IQs above 75, including online videos featuring individuals with executive function disorders raising awareness and explaining in a strength-based way to fully develop their executive function capabilities, a manual listing all resources for those with executive function defects, learning modules and instructional videos teaching daily tasks that involve executive function, and a free, line, a free online webinar series to enable individuals with execution, executive function deficiencies to access government supports. Two, to urge the provincial government to improve funding for community living disability services CLDS and other organizations which can provide support for those with executive function disorders in order to reduce wait times for those who need to access them. To urge the provincial government to recognize that individuals with executive function disorders with a normal to high IQ have great potential to be gainfully employed provided they have some supports and to set up initiatives to help these individuals get and keep jobs, including a public awareness campaign. To urge the provincial government to recognize that individuals who are helping those with executive function disorders are essential partners and enable them to accompany the person into a hospital or other situations as necessary, regardless of age. To urge the provincial government to mandate that all teachers take courses on learning disabilities, including executive function disorders, during their post-secondary education in order to better understand and educate and end the discrimination they often experience in the classroom. Signed by Richard Oakton, Douglas Adams, John Gross, and many, many other Manitobans.
In accordance with our Rule 133, bracket 6, when petitions are read, they are deemed to be received by the House. The Honourable Member for the Paw County said. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I wish to present the following petition to the Legislative Assembly. The background to this petition is as follows. Number one, Provincial Road 224 serves Peg West First Nation, Fisher River Cree Nation, and surrounding communities. The road is in need of substantial repairs. Number two, the road has been in poor condition for years. <coughs> and has numerous potholes, uneven driving services, and extremely narrow shoulders. Number three, due to recent population growth in the area, there has been increased vehicle and pedestrian use of Provincial Road 224. Number four, without repair, Provincial Road 224 will come to pose a hazard to the many Manitobans who use it on a regular basis. Number five, concerned Manitobans are requesting that Provincial Road 224 be assessed and repaired urgently to improve safety for its users. We petition the Legislative Assembly of Manitoba as follows to urge the Minister of Infrastructure to complete an assessment of Provincial Road 224 and implement the appropriate repairs using public funds as quickly as possible. This petition has been signed by many, many fine Manitobans. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Elmwood. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I wish to present the following petition to the Legislative Assembly. The background of this petition is as follows. Number one, cities across Canada and the United States, including Chicago, Washington, D.C., Salinas, California, and Aurelia, Ontario, are offering home security rebate programs that enhance public safety and allow for more efficient use of their policing resources. Number two, home security surveillance systems protect homes and businesses by potentially deterring Burglaries. Number three, whole neighborhoods benefit when more homes and businesses have these security systems. Number four, a 2022 Angus Reid Institute poll found 70% of Winnipeggers surveyed believe crime had increased over the last five years, the highest percentage found among cities in Canada. Number five, the same survey reported half of Winnipeggers polled did not feel safe while walking alone at night and almost 20% of them said they were a victim of police-reported crime in the last two years. Number six, although the public understands that what the criminologists and community advocates point to as the main drivers of crime, namely the larger issues of lack of food, addictions, and poverty, they support rebate programs like these as they help the most vulnerable in our community by removing financial barriers for personal protection. We petition the Legislative Assembly of Manitoba as follows, to urge the provincial government to work with municipalities to establish a province-wide tax rebate or another incentive program to encourage residents and businesses to purchase approved home and business security systems. And this petition is signed by many, many Manitobans. Further petitions? If not, grievances? Orders of the day, government business. The Honourable Official Opposition House Leader. Miigwech, Madam Speaker. Um, I would like to table the list of five bills designated by the Official Opposition for this fifth session of the 42nd Legislature. The five designated bills for this session are Bill 9, the Liquor, Gaming and Cannabis Control Amendment and Manitoba Liquor and Lotteries Corporation Amendment Act. Bill 20, the Conflict of Interest Members and Ministers Amendment Act. Bill 28, the Local Government Statutes Amendment Act. Bill 30, the Liquor, Gaming and Cannabis Control Act and Manitoba Liquor and Lotteries Corporation Amendment Act, bracket two. Bill 33, the Addictions Services Act. The Honourable Government House Leader. Yeah, thank you, um, Madam Speaker. A couple of things, um, well, at least one before we go through the list of business this afternoon. Um, I believe that there, if you canvass the House, you'll find that there is agreement to call a recess 
today, um, because it's a later night sitting and because there's an event happening here in the assembly, uh, between 5 p.m. and 6 p.m. Uh, and so I might ask if you canvass the house is if we can have a recess between 5 and 6 p.m. and perhaps ring the bells uh, one, minute. one minute prior to 6 p.m. Is there leave for a one hour recess between 5 and 6 p.m. this evening with a one minute ringing of bells? Leave has been granted. The Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker, and I thank members of the House for the uh, provision of that leave. Could you please call for second reading this afternoon, bills number 38, 21, 36, 11, 34, 32, 35, 6, 10, 13, 31, 23, I'll just finish the list. I understand that some of this will be uh, done tomorrow, not all today, and, and member, the opposition house here and I can have further discussions if there's concern, but I'm reading the list as it will be uh, for the next two days. I think I left off at 23, 26, 29, 2, 24, and 7. And with the exception of the first bill that I called, which is bill number 38, the remainder are specified bills. It has been announced that the House will consider second reading of bill 38 this afternoon, followed by the specified bills of 21, 36, 11, 34, 32, 35, 6, 10, 13, 31, 23, 26, 29, 2, 24, and 7. So I will therefore start by calling second reading of Bill 38, the Builders' Liens Amendment Act Prompt Payment. The Honourable Minister for Consumer Protection and Government Services. I believe I'm supposed to move first, right? I don't have a script, so. I move seconded by the, oh, you're gonna give me a script? Wonderful, I will pause. The Honourable Minister for Consumer Protection and Government Services. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move, seconded by the Honourable Minister for Justice, that Bill Number 38, the Builders' Lien Amendment Act, prompt payment, loi modificant, loi sur les privilèges du constructeur parlement rapide, be now read a second time and be referred to a committee of this House. Her Honour, the Lieutenant Governor, has been advised of the bill, and I table the message. It has been moved by the Honourable Minister for Consumer Protection and Government Services, seconded by the Honourable Minister of Justice, that Bill Number 38, the Builders' Liens Amendment Act, prompt payment be now read a second time and be referred to a committee of this House. Her Honour, the Lieutenant Governor, has been advised of the bill and the message has been tabled. The Honourable Minister of Consumer Protection and Government Services. Thank you, Madam Speaker. This bill uh, establishes requirements for prompt payment here in Manitoba. It was directly informed by the experiences and concerns that we have heard from stakeholders who represent diverse interests within Manitoba's construction industry and from stakeholders like the Manitoba Bar Association who regularly work with builders' liens legislation. It is not a government bill or a partisan bill. It is a construction industry bill. So we heard directly from Manitoba businesses that delayed payments have caused significant problems and financial hardship, even bankruptcy, throughout the payment chain on construction projects 
That's especially the case for small and medium-sized businesses. Recognizing that the livelihoods of many Manitobans working in the construction industry depend on prompt payment, especially for, for the businesses at the end of the payment chain, we have brought forward these amendments that include prompt payment within the Builders' Liens Act, and that respond to the concerns of these Manitoba businesses and also aligns with prompt payment rules in other provinces. I thank the member for Brandon West especially for his tireless advocacy on this file. He has done so, so much. And uh, in the case of this bill, I think I'm, I'm a very short person standing on some very tall shoulders that, uh, that are his. Very broadly, this bill establishes uh, deadlines to pay a construction invoice owing for work and services and materials once an invoice is given for payment. A prompt payment of an invoice once owing is expected in Manitoba and within Canada. A Bill 38 extends and formalizes these obligations and responsibilities so that contractors and subcontractors are paid on time for their work, services and materials and so that they can meet their own financial obligations and contribute to Manitoba's economic growth. Very generally, the bill introduces a number of obligations and responsibilities on both parties, the contractor or subcontractor submitting the invoice for payment, and the owner, contractor or subcontractor who, who is required to pay the invoice for work owing. This includes establishing the requirement for a proper invoice, establishing deadlines for making payments, including the requirement of the owner to pay the contractor within 28 days, requiring the owner to give a notice of non-payment within 14 days when the amount of the payment is in dispute, requiring contractors to pay their subcontractors within seven days after receiving full or partial payment from the owner, and setting rules for paying subcontractors when a partial payment is made, and requiring interest on delayed payments. In addition to establishing prompt payment obligations, the bill also creates a new adjudication process to resolve payment disputes. For example, if a contractor gives a subcontractor a notice of non-payment because the owner failed to pay the contractor, or the contractor disputes a subcontractor's payments, then the contractor must refute the, refer the dispute to adjudication within 21 days. The parties may agree on the adjudicator, but if they can't agree, the party who just requested adjudication may ask the adjudicating authority to appoint an adjudicator. The adjudication authority is responsible for training assessing, and assessing the qualifications and establishing a registry of adjudicators. The adjudication authority must appoint an adjudicator within seven days after being requested to do so. Documents to be used for adjudicating a prompt payment dispute must be provided to the parties within five days after the adjudicator's appointment. Adjudicators must act in an impartial manner and make their determination and provide it to the parties within 30 days after receiving the adjudication documents. These are just a few examples of the obligations and responsibilities established by this bill. As a recent letter from the Manitoba Prompt Payment Coalition representing 32 trade associations and union states, Bill 38 has the unequivocal support of the entire construction industry. Let me just say that again. Bill 38 has the unequivocal support of the entire construction industry. And this is especially remarkable since there can be competing interests depending on where you are in the construction payment chain. However, I want to thank all owners, contractors and subcontractors operating within the payment chain for working together to support the establishment of comprehensive prompt payment framework and the adjudication model all within the Builders' Liens Act that will benefit all of Manitoba's construction industry and its employees. Thank you to the stakeholder representatives from all parts of the Manitoba construction industry for their time and uh, taking time to engage at events and to share their experiences, concerns and feedback regarding the immediate need to establish a fair and functional prompt payment process and dispute resolution model. While not an exhaustive list, thank you especially to stakeholder representatives from the Manitoba Prompt Payment Coalition, the Manitoba Heavy Construction Association, the Winnipeg Construction Association, the Manitoba Bar Association, the Construction Association of Rural Manitoba, Merit Contractors Association of Manitoba, Manitoba Building Trades and the General Contractors Alliance of Canada. I look forward to getting this bill moved forward to committee promptly. And yes, that pun was fully intended. A question period of up to 15 minutes will be held. Questions may be addressed to the minister by any member in the following sequence. The first question by the official opposition critic or designate. Subsequent questions asked by critics or designates from other recognized opposition parties. Subsequent questions asked by each independent member. Remaining questions asked by any opposition member and no question or answer shall exceed 45 
seconds. The floor is open for questions. The Honourable Member for Maples. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Thank you to the Minister for bringing this bill forward uh, on behalf of the construction industry. I know he uh, earlier just mentioned a few people who uh, are supportive of this bill, pretty much the whole construction industry. But I'd still like to ask uh, who did he consult with? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I know a lot when I get one and uh, happy to answer the, uh, on behalf of uh, that member. What I will say first is that a lot of the consultations actually occurred before I was appointed to, to this ministry. I've been in this role now for just a couple of months, um, but prior to me, the MLA for Bri Brandon West had worked for years on this file and it consulted with very, very many stakeholders. But I will read that list again um, that I have in front of me, which is the Manitoba Prompt Payment Coalition, the Manitoba Heavy Construction Association, you might know Mr. Uh, Chris Lawrence, um, as representing there who gave us that wonderful quote about how this has the unequivocal support of the entire construction industry. The Winnipeg Construction Association, Manitoba Bar Association, <laughs> Construction Association of R Rural Manitoba, Merit Contractors of Manitoba. The Minister's time oh. has expired. The Honourable Member for the Maples. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I think it probably this question is probably pretty much on everybody's mind. Who will pay for the adjudication process? Like, who will, which party will pay for that process? The Honourable Minister. <coughs> All right. It might be on everybody's minds, but uh, but the answer is not readily coming to me. My apologies to the member. I'll be sure to uh, to have these kind of detailed questions answered at uh, at committee, and I encourage him to keep his speech short so that we can move this along and get it to uh, get it to committee and get into the details. Thank you. The honourable member for the Maples. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. How long does the minister accept that it will take the bring, uh, to bring the regulations into force, like when it will be forced? The Honourable Minister. That, that is a great question. And uh, certainly, I think we're in a, we're in a good position as, as a province now because we do have a neighbouring jurisdictions with uh, relatively mature uh, legislation and regulations to go along with it. Um, so this has my attention as a, as a minister. I've committed to... Uh, to the association um, and to all the, the stakeholders uh, that have been represented. I've committed to the, to the member for Brandon West that, that I'll be pushing to move this uh, legislation forward. Um, at the same time, I think the member can appreciate there is a fair bit of, uh, of regulatory uh, work to do. Um, so we'll be doing that. I'll keep him informed as, as that work uh, proceeds. And uh, we'll continue to do that uh, as required, even if that means uh, working on it through the summer. The Honourable Member for the Maples. This bill help ensure that construction projects are completed on time. The Honourable Minister. Uh, thank you. Yeah, good question. I think you know a healthy construction industry is is really what uh, what we want to have coming out of this bill, and that's what's going to get um, buildings built built quickly. Prior to this bill, sometimes you'd have cons contractors that were required to do work. Um, and required to outlay significant amounts of capital for materials and for wages um, without any assurance that they would receive uh, money on the other side. Um, this unfortunately put some, some subcontractors in such a state that they were just unable to continue carrying on business. Now you want to talk about an impact to a construction project timeline, I can tell you that one of your subcontractors going, going out of business is a significant impact or having to downsize at least. So this, I think, is going to ensure that our construction industry is healthy. The construction industry... The, the Honourable Minister's time done. has expired. The Honourable Member for the Maples. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, also, another question probably all Manitobans mind is, why is the PC government not investing in critical infrastructure in our province? The Honourable Minister. Well, I think I'll have to dispute the assertion there in that, in that question because we are making significant investments as a government, and I know the member knows because he uh, asked that question with a little smile and a wink. 
So uh, what I will say is that, uh, that we continue to make significant investments both on horizontal and vertical infrastructure. The, the, the minister for, uh, or the member for Turtle Mountain who sits immediately to my left as our minister for transportation and infrastructure, he's making significant investments in roads across this province. And as uh, minister of consumer protection and government services, I'm also making significant investments as well as our health minister who's building things like the St. Boniface emergency room expansion. The Honourable Member for the Maples. Uh, can the Minister highlight the important work that is done by the member of construction industry? The Honourable Minister. Oh, we're back to getting wonderful lobs, and I do very much appreciate that. The construction industry represents 8% of all uh, employment in Manitoba. It is a, it's a huge contributor uh, to our economic uh, engine but it also lays the foundation for more work to be done. Often the things that are getting built, whether that's critical infrastructure, whether those you know, new buildings, new schools, all the things that are happening in or on these pieces of critical infrastructure that is built by our construction association goes to continue to um, grow our economy and expand our province. And that goes from everything from a, from a home that they might be building and just down the street from my house to the St. Boniface emergency room expansion to uh, new highways to Centerport. All of that provides the a Honourable Minister's of time has expired. The Honourable Member for River Heights. Uh, yeah, uh, I just uh, would like to ask the uh, member. Uh, why it took seven years to bring this bill forward. It would seem to be a, an important bill that should have been brought forward in 2016 instead of having to wait this long. The Honourable Minister. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. I, I know the Liberals like to, to look backwards and we like to look forwards. Um, I think the member is reasonably familiar with some of the legislative uh, history here, but the last, uh, certainly the last go round, there was a, a significant interest from the uh, Building and Trades Association not to have this bill introduced as a standalone piece of legislation, but rather to integrate it into the Builders Liens Act. That required significant effort, and that effort has been underway for quite a number of months. And, uh, and you can see the result of that effort in the, in the bill that you have before us today. But we just want to move forward. We want to make sure that, that Manitoba is uh, having prompt payment legislation, just like our neighboring jurisdictions. The Honourable Member for St. Boniface. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Just on the question, I know that um, for the liens, the liens amendment back in prompt payment, was there ever a similar act consider, or considered when it comes to collective bargaining, a, a prompt, set prompt settlement for collective bargaining? The Honourable Minister. Well, 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 this member sure likes to stir the pot, but I think that uh, Manitoba has a proud history of, of uh, successful labor negotiations and even some quite notable historical ones that the member for Flint Flon would be happy, happy to uh, tell us all about. But what I would say is that our, our labor um, uh, regulations and legislation that we have before us is certainly something that, uh, that every government should be making sure is working for the good of workers and for the good of uh, employers so that we can have a, a successful, prosperous province. That's what everybody wants. That's what's good for Manitoba. Are there any further questions? Seeing none, the time for questions is over. The floor is open for debate. The Honourable Member for the Maples. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. It is my honour to rise in the House today to put a few words on the record regarding Builders Lean Amendment Act prompt payment. This bill amend the Buildings Lien Act, a prompt payment scheme is established to facilitate the timely flow of construction projects funds by imposing payments deadline on each party in the construction industry. The time for payment, to, the time for payment starts to run when the construction contractor gives the power owner a proper invoice containing required information requesting payment of amount invoiced by the contractor for work, services and materials provided that month by the contractor and its subcontractors. Mandatory initiating interest is charged on outstanding payment when the deadlines are not met. 
A payer may suspend its payment obligation to a payee by issuing a notice that sets out the reason for non-payment. Dispute under the payment promote payment scheme may be resolved by adjudicator. Further work on a construction project may be halted if the payer fail to pay after final determination of the dispute that has been made by trained adjudicator. To accommodate the prompt payment schemes deadline related to lien remedy under the Act are extended from 40 days to 60 days. The prompt payment scheme applies to owners, subcontractors, and subcontractors and subcontractors who are subject to lien and trust remedies under the Act in relation to contractors and subcontractor entering into our into on or after date the amendment came into force. So this is a good bill, Mr. Uh, Deputy Speaker. I meant by NDP party and uh, this side of the house, we are in support of this bill too. And uh, we are really, really looking for this bill to be passed. And so the contractor and subcontractor can easily resolve the issues instead of going to the court through the adjudicators. The construction industry accounts for approximately 8% of Manitoba's employment and it is a significant contributor to the economic stability of the Manitoba. With the construction season rolling around as the weather gets warm, it is important we ensure that those working in the industry are getting paid for the, their hard work. Construction workers provide essential service to our province that allow us to have safe roads and, build, roads and buildings, helping us create a productive and prosperous province for all. Protecting these workers, contractor and subcontractor, is something the NDP strongly believe in. Making sure that contractor and subcontractor are paid on time is in all of our best interests. It's a good for the business, but it's also good for the families. This means that working can bring, workers can bring home money on time, as rightly earned from work they have put in. Most Manitoban construction contractors are small and medium-sized companies with limited cash flow and limited access to credit. Most getting paid on time is essential for these small businesses to pay for their bills on time and continue offering their service for the next project. Furthermore, hiring the right people at the right time is critical for much of the seasonal construction work, which is often hindered due to a backlog in payment. Mr. Deputy Speaker, delayed payment for construction work, work that has already been completed limits the ability of a small and medium-sized contractor to invest in their business and hire apprentice. New, De New Democrats have a strong history as a building in this province. We invest in public infrastructure, we invest in housing, and we make important invest in investment in Manitoba Hydro. So with this, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I, uh, along with the Manitoba NDP caucus, are really strong uh, supporting in this bill. And we would also like to thank uh, the contractor and subcontracting contractors that they have made all the works in Manitoba to build Manitoba and uh, build Manitoba's economy. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The Honourable Member for St. Boniface. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I'll just put a few uh, words on the record. Um, we, we support the efforts of uh, construction industry contractors who've sought a change to payment schedules and uh, deadlines for payers on construction contracts. Uh, the amendment follows what is referred to as the, quote, 28, 7 and 7 formula, established by the introduction of prompt payment legislation on, in Ontario, meaning that an owner needs to pay a general contractor within 28 days of receiving the invoice. The general contractor then has to pay their subcontractors within seven days of receiving payment, and their subsequent contractors need to pay any of their subcontractors 
within seven days of receiving their part of the payment. Now, although this bill does cover concerns related to prompt payment, industry leaders have brought forward some concerns about the bill regarding adjudication, uh, which hopefully will be dealt with. The Winnipeg Construction Association and the Construction Association of Rural Manitoba have both brought forward issues concerning what adjudication would look like and what the entity that uh, would look after it, uh, how it would be composed. Because, uh, for example, Saskatchewan has the Saskatchewan Construction Dispute Resolution Office, which has the broad involvement of people in the industry, contractor, contractors, subcontractors, and consultancy groups. The current bill allows for one of two things, either a government employee to be the nominating authority and after that an entity that would look after the adjudication. Uh, Terry Urban, who's the health and safety manager with Park West Projects Limited, did emphasize the importance of the adjudication structure by noting that since most construction companies are small subcontractors, when a pay dispute arises, they're awful unable to afford the exorbitant costs of lawyer fees to fight for their pay. Uh, Urban further pointed out that Manitoba Hydro and Manitoba Transportation and Infrastructure will not be bound through the legislation to the terms of the prompt payment scheme. Uh, perhaps that's something that uh, we can examine um, uh, in amendments, but certainly uh, if, we're, if we're talking about uh, Manitoba infrastructure, uh, infrastructure and Manitoba Hydro, we're talking about two of the largest investors in terms of, or, or large, largest uh, general contractors uh, in the province. So uh, we certainly hope that uh, that will be included and considered because uh, contractors and subcontractors who work for Manitoba infrastructure as well as for Manitoba Hydro deserve prompt payment as well. And with that, I will say this is a bill we will support. Thank you. Is the House ready for the question? Okay, the question before the House is second reading of Bill 38, the Builders' Liens Amendment Act, prompt payment. Is it the pleasure of the House to adopt the motion? Agreed. Agreed and so ordered. I declare the motion carried. We will now move, as previously announced, to second reading of Bill 21, the Highway Traffic Amendment Act. The Honourable Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. <clears throat> I move, second by the Honourable Minister of Health, that Bill 21, the Highway Traffic Amendment Act, be now read a second time and be referred to the committee of this House. Short page. <laughs> it has been moved by the Honourable Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure, seconded by the Honourable Minister of Health, that Bill 21, the Highway Traffic Amendment Act, be now read a second time and be referred to a committee of this House. The Honourable Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I am pleased to today about the Bill 21, the Highway Traffic Act Amendment Act. This bill is, uh, will make Manitoba's roads safer by strengthening the oversight of heavy commercial vehicle operators. In 2019, uh, the Office of the Auditor General made a number of recommendations intended to improve the way that government re regulates heavy commercial vehicles, Mr. Deputy Speaker. At that time, the government made a commitment to implementing these recommendations, and I am proud to say that we have been making steady progress towards this goal by making and updates of our policies and regulations. This bill, in its next steps of implementing the Auditor General's recommendations, will strengthen checks for so-called chameleon carriers. These are unsafe operators who have been, or in danger of being, put out of business for safety violations. Instead of coming into compliance with the law, chameleon carriers get around enforcement actions by opening up a new business under a new name and entity. Sometimes you use it corporation names. For example, we know that, for instance, where operators are shut down for multiple safety violations, but then reappear as a different company at a short time later without having made any significant safety improvements, Mr. Deputy Speaker. This legislation will allow government to take stronger action to address chameleon carriers by empowering of officials to refuse or revoke any operator safety fitness certificates if they are known to be affiliated with a chameleon carrier. It also allows officials to sign a new operator's conditional safety rating if there is known to be safety issues with that carrier. Previously, all new carriers 
were given a satisfactory unaudited safety rating regardless of their safety history. We do want to make sure that these are new authorities are used appropriately and that the safe operators are not accidentally caught up in attempts to catch chameleon carriers. As a result, operators who believe that they have been treated unfairly have the right to appeal these decisions to the Licensing Suspension Appeal Board, which is independent, uh, quasi judicial uh, ju um, body. I can say generally as well as this bill will have minimal impacts on heavy vehicle operators who comply with the safety regulations, whose safely performance is in good standings. Safe operators are not at the target of this bill. In fact, the legislation will help to level the playing field by ensuring that safe operators are not un un cut by the operators trying to save costs by not allowing safe safety rules. In addition, this changes relate to chameleon carriers. The bill will also make some changes to upgrade, update, and clarify some of the updates sections of the Highway Traffic Act related to the process of applying for a safety fitness certificate. This will help to ensure that heavy commercial vehicle operators are aware of the legal requirements, making it easier for them to know that what they need to do to comply. For example, this bill will move certain requirements currently in regulations to the Act and other requirements in Act to regulations, which will put similar requirements together to ease and, uh, of the understanding and shift technical requirements into regulations where they can be more easily kept up to date. This legislation is also re revised and updated on the record keeping requirements for heavy vehicle operators and their drivers. This will ensure that commercial drivers carry a copy of their operation safety fitness certificate with them on their vehicle. Also, operators will be needed to ensure that drivers' obstructs are reviewed and assessed on a regular basis to make sure that the drivers have safe driving records and are fit for operating a heavy vehicle on our roads. I'm Mr. Deputy Speaker. That includes makes, making sure that um, the public is safe when it comes to um, you know, the transportation industry. And Mr. Deputy Speaker, I know the heavy construction industry has been asking for this to make sure that when it comes to their, their industry, that they have a good standing, good operations, and uh, have, have good reputation for the industry. So these are by, by compliant, um, to, to uh, you know, communicating with the, with the industry and consulting with the industry. These are why we, we have to make these changes, Mr. Deputy Speaker. So I, I just want to give, put a few words on the table, and thank you very much. Good job. Question period of up to 15 minutes will be held. Questions may be addressed to the minister by any member in the following sequence. First question by the official opposition critic or designate. Subsequent questions asked by critics or designates from other recognized opposition parties. Subsequent questions asked by each independent member. Remaining questions asked by any opposition members and no question and no answer shall exceed 45 seconds. The floor is open for questions. The Honorable Member for Kiwatanuk. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I wonder if the Minister can uh, tell us who is consulted on this bill and uh, do they support the changes that it makes? The Honourable Minister. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, when it comes to consulting, we, our, our department has just consulted with the heavy, uh, heavy Manitoba Trucking Association to making sure that uh, when it comes to uh, cleaning up the legislation here, to making sure that uh, Again, they, their industry doesn't want to have a reputation of having these chameleons who, uh, you know, have had a bad track record and then could try to uh, re-register with another corporation or another name, and making sure that the, um, you know, there's there's the they follow regulations and the safety certificates and making sure that it's it's safe for the amount of drivers. Sounds good. The Honourable Member for Kiwatanuk. I wonder if the minister could tell us what type of penalties will be imposed on people who are required to obtain a safety fitness certificate but failed to. The Honourable Minister. Thanks, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, when it comes to the penalties, it would be basically if, if there have been violations and they, they haven't been upgraded on their safety certificate and they haven't made any changes, um, they can be shut down. And, and then, then, then they have to go into the appeal process to making sure are, are doing appropriate um, conditions of what they need to do to make them safer and to making sure that they comply uh, with the regulations that we're setting forward here. And this has been asked by the Heavy Manitoba Trucking Association. 
The Honorable Member for Kiwatanook. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I'm wondering, uh, when the Minister refers to the penalty that will be imposed, uh, would it be on a permanent record, or is there a length of time where that penalty would potentially be removed? The Honourable Minister. Well, it thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. When it comes to um, being violations of, of the safety requirements, when it comes to um, the safety certificate, again, these, these people, these, these companies will be on record and until they actually change their, their practice when it comes to safer and follow the compliance of the, uh, of the regulations, Mr. Deputy Speaker, then over time, it will have to be time and that they would be also be granted that, you know what, it, they have a better track record and it's based on um, history. The Honourable Member for Kuwatanuk. Uh, just wondering a little bit more to that question, if the Minister could say when he refers to a length of time, is, is there a length of time that's already attributed to that, a month, three months, six months, a year, years. The Honourable Minister. Well, Mr. Deputy Speaker, if, um, the, the member that question, asked the question from King Waitenuk, it's based on, um, it's gonna be based on when they were able to uh, change their practices and it'd be on, it'd be on an individual basis. Um, if there's been violations that were very seriously, Mr. Deputy Speaker, then it might be take a little bit longer for their record to uh, to clear. Uh, if it, if it's uh, a, a minor violations that they were able to work together with the with the uh, you know when it comes to the um, committee that they have to go in front of, um, they might be able to get that off the record um, or, uh, you know in, in in better time, Mr. Deputy Speaker. But again, this is basically making sure that people who have been violating. The, when it comes to the safety certificates. The um, Honourable Minister's uh, time has expired. The Honourable Member for Kiwatanook. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The, the Minister referred to, to chameleon carriers and, and people trying to kind of uh, go around the system by becoming a chameleon carrier, a carrier, chameleon carrier, sorry. Um, so is, is there going to be also a, a, a list, for example, of individuals that attempt to do, do that on, on a number of occasions that they'll be maybe, I don't want to use the word, uh, uh, blacklisted or or whatever but would they be then uh, ineligible to to apply after a certain period certain amount of attempts to be able to become a chameleon carrier the honorable minister well thank you thank you mr deputy speaker it depends on the, the severity of the violations uh, mr deputy speaker and when it comes to uh um, each of the companies they're going to have a compliance officer much like our industry when i was in the investment industry we had to have a compliance officer for every office that had uh, financial planners, Mr. Deputy Speaker. In this case, it's going to be for trucking companies. There's going to be a compliance officer, and that's where we don't want a, a, just a plain relative or somebody who, is, who doesn't really work in the, in, in the company. We want somebody who is uh, on a day-to-day -day, day -day basis is that compliance operator. And so this is where how this is how they can re um, change their the way that they're doing things by having the, a dedicated compliance officer. The Honourable Member for Kiwatanuk. Uh, yes, Mr. Deputy Speaker. So is there also a penalty for uh, uh, negligence by a, a company or a compliance officer who fails to do their due diligence and, and brings on somebody who is in fact uh, does not ha have a safety fitness certificate but they're still employed? The Honourable Minister. Well, thanks, Mr. Deputy Speaker. When it comes to uh, the compliance officer, they will have a, a, a regulations that they have to follow to make sure that all the rules are all set out, and that's where the regulations are going to be coming from from this from this bill, this amendment act. And the thing is, we also, when it comes to chameleon carriers, it's not just uh, people who are within the province of Manitoba that we're we're operating here, and then they then change their names and operate in, in the same province. It's also people who have been with other provinces. We need a history of those individuals and making sure that we work with other provinces to make sure that if that, com that, per that individual, that company comes into Manitoba, that they also have uh, proper certificates uh, in other provinces. The Honourable Member for Kiwatanuk. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, just, just a question about the, the, the fees themselves. Um, when you talk to the trucking industry, um, again, uh, and it's, it's not exclusive to the trucking industry, but um, being able to recruit, retain employees and, and workers. Uh, so with that, I would like to ask the question, will there be any financial support for workers required to in fact obtain a safety fitness certificate for the job, but who are unable to afford the $200 application fee? The Honorable Minister. 
Well, that's, um, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. When it comes to uh, new employees like that, this is where the opportunity is where, where they come and work for a company and uh, they're employed by that company. Hopefully that the company will do all the appropriate uh, costs of um, bringing that employee into uh, being able to work. If that, if that company requires that, that demand of, of employees, they're going to be able to do everything possible to make sure that person can actually be driving safely on Manitoba highways. And um, so when it comes to uh, new drivers, like again, it's like, it's like a, starting your own business. It's an investment in your own operations. If you're, you're becoming a trucker yourself, the thing is there's all these appropriate costs to start a business. And this is no different when it comes to the safety certificate. The Honourable Member for St. Boniface. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, a question for the Minister. Many operators employ temporary foreign workers. Uh, has the Minister considered how the terms of the Act might affect the work of temporary foreign workers whose employment may be tied to their immigration applications? The Honourable Minister. So when it comes to, um, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, when it comes to foreign workers, this is why, again, um, they'll have compliance, every company will have a compliance officer to make sure that everybody that works in that, in that company has like a lot of um, requirements to make sure that they go onto our Manitoba highways or a, a Canadian highways, making sure that um, they're qualified and they have safety certificates, they've been educated, they had gone through some courses to make sure that they, uh, they can um, be able to drive safely and um, and have and establish a record of safe driving. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Kiwatanuk. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, will there be any penalties for drivers of a, regular, a re regulated vehicle operating under a safety feature certificate, like they have an actual certificate, but they do not carry the actual copy of the certificate with them? Will they be penalized? The Honourable Minister. Well, thanks, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I, just like anything, when you when you don't have your your driver's license or your registration, I know I've had um, people that I know that actually have had uh, uh, a fine for not having their uh, registration of six hundred dollars. I know somebody who didn't have their driver's license got another three hundred dollar fine. So this is something that well, once the regulations and everything gets set up here, we go to justice and they will actually set, set up uh, fines for when it comes to uh, the amount of money and cost of uh, getting a fine. <laughs> yeah. The Honourable Member for Kiwatanuk. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I understand uh, like every 12 months an operator must obtain the driving records of those who are drive for the operator and review those records within 30 days to determine whether the driver is fit to continue to drive for the operator. Uh, 30 days is also uh, seems like a, a longer window than necessary. Is there any opportunities then that that window of review would be shortened from 30 days to maybe a week or so? The Honourable Minister. Well, I think that's also, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I think that's what the important is once, once we get into this, um, when the trucking industry has these compliance officers and making sure that they streamline and they, you know, if they do the right things, we have, we have some good driving records in Manitoba, hopefully that maybe that timeline can be actually shortened because we can get through, there won't be as many people going through that process and uh, making sure that everybody comply, comply, complies with the uh, regulations and, uh, and making sure that, um, again, we know that time is money and we want to make sure that the trucking industry doesn't have, like they're, they're challenged enough when it comes to finding um, re, uh, new workers all, all the time. So we want to make sure that we work with the industry, we talk with the industry, we'll definitely have converse, uh, conversations and, and consultations. The Honourable Member for Kiwatanuk. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, if this uh, piece of legislation becomes law, how does the government intend to inform the affected individuals and industries about the changes that are made under this bill? The Honourable Minister. Well, there's some of the changes that are going to happen, Mr. Deputy Speaker. When it comes to, I just got notification here that when it comes to truck, the cost of transport services, um, we're making sure that when this Bill 21 is, is passed, that it's not going to affect the cost of uh, um, operations of our, of, of, you know, when it comes to companies, making sure that it doesn't get passed on to, on the consumer. We want to make sure that um, we have streamlined and um, again, we want to make sure we want to work with um, the trucking industry and making sure that uh, we don't affect, um, dis disrupt the uh, supply chain. It's important that's been really been impacted in the last two years. We want to continue that we work together with these companies, making sure that everybody comply complies with uh, safety. And again, it's 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 a win-win. The for minister's time has expired. Are there any other questions? 
Seeing none, we will now move from questions to debate. The floor is open for debate. The Honorable Member for Kiwatanuk. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I'd like to uh, uh, thank the Minister for bringing forth this piece of, le this piece of legislation. Um, safety, of course, is the utmost importance of everybody in this chamber, everybody across Manitoba. So if there are things that we can do as legislators, uh, wherever you may reside in, in the province of Manitoba, whether it be in rural, urban, or wherever it may be, uh, if we can do anything to improve safety of our citizens, I think that's a, it's important that we do that, that we go across party lines to be able to do that. So examples of legislation like, like Bill 21, uh, for example, help us to do that. And they help us to do that in a, in a number of different ways. And it's, it's calling for accountability. It's calling for accountability from industry, from Manitobans, from individuals, um, to be able to do what's right. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, we, we've, and, and it's unfortunate that a number of us over the years in Manitoba, and I think in fact it, it may in fact be all of us in, across Manitoba, have been affected by, by tragedy of some sort, uh, and in particular tragedy on our roadways or our highway system, uh, whether it be uh, extended family or, or even uh, your, your directly infected uh, siblings or children or parents or grandparents. Um, and, and it just reminds me of uh, uh, stories that, that I constantly hear. And it's unfortunate that we hear that on such a regular basis. Uh, you know, just, just most recently, I mean, there was a school bus crash in southern Manitoba, right, where, where students were, were hurt, um, uncontrolled intersections, and those types that are, um, that are unfortunate. And it's, it's very sad that um, here we are in, in 2023 still having to kind of hold people accountable and hold people accountable for their actions um, and put pieces of legislation and law in place to try and prevent people from being able to circumvent those kind of accountability and those kind of laws that we have in place. And uh, the changes made in, in Bill 21 do something just like that. Uh, the, the minister referred to chameleon carriers and just in its definition alone, it's just somebody who's kind of tried to, to hide and avoid accountability in a system uh, for actions that they may have done, for actions that they've done in the past, whether it be with a different carrier or whether it be as an individual. So now, uh, this legislation will now hold them accountable. It will follow them wherever they go in Manitoba, and I think I heard the minister say, wherever they go, maybe across Canada, across interprovincial jurisdictions, uh, and that's the right thing to do. Uh, if you've ever, um, had your, your, your license checked and, and the minister referred to being, you know, having his, his license called for by, uh, I, I assume, either the RCMP or the local police, you know, and uh, here's what I have, this is my license. And you do get asked sometimes, are you prevented from driving in, in a different jurisdiction, you know, in Ontario or Saskatchewan or United States? And that's more like a, a, a chance for you to be uh, honest. Uh, yes, I have, or no, I'm not. Uh, but this legislation now will have something in place where that will now be called on. So your safety fitness certificate will, will show um, your history in that regard. So Mr. Deputy Speaker, um, especially, and, and I know this, this primarily uh, affects um, heavy trucking and the trucking industry. So when you have uh, a small family going, going around in a minivan or a little compact car and having to take on a, a heavy truck, for example, that's something that that small car and that family is not going to win. So it's imperative that the person behind that wheel and driving and transporting uh, that heavy equipment and that heavy truck is, is accountable and is safe by the standards put forth by this piece of legislation. And that's important for a number of different reasons. First and foremost is safety, but one is the accountability and the peace of mind that all Manitobans will have knowing that when they approach and they go on a single lane highway and there's a truck coming their way, that that's a, that's a person who's qualified to be there, who's safely qualified to be there, and they have no fear to, to think that there is um, at risk because of trying to circumvent a system that may be in place. So we do a lot of legislation in this chamber about kind of housekeeping and tightening up various pieces of legislation that we have here to make it more clear, more concrete, more effective, and this piece of legislation does do that. 
And I mean, we could go on, and I understand we, we only have, you know, uh, maybe 10, 20, 30 minutes of debate sometimes, and we can get into the, the, the legislation and the, the infrastructure shortfalls of the government, but that's not what I'm here to do today. I, I'd like to be able to, to speak directly to the effects and the impacts that we're going to see from day one. From day one, when this, when this piece of legislation comes into effect, there will be a positive change made forward. There will be a positive change towards safety and well-being of Manitobans on our roads here in Manitoba. And that's the priority that we all need to take and we all need to have. But Mr. Deputy Speaker, there, there, is, there is a few things there that sometimes it gets, it gets tied up in the, in the questions and gets a little bit lost in the, uh, the, the translation of some things. And that's what we have the question period for. Um, so, so I did ask the question, uh, what, what types of penalties will be imposed on people who, who are required to obtain but won't? And sometimes maybe we, we talk about putting those in regulation, but also we need to put those in legislation. So those penalties need to be discussed today also. And it's discussed, and a penalty is more, uh, not so much as enforcement, but it really should be used as a deterrent. So if we put strong pieces of, of, of legislation into the, the penalty part of it and a strong deterrent, then we've already kind of helped that battle and helped that fight along the way. Because we shouldn't be about enforcement, we should be about kind of working together and a deterrent from, from breaking any kind of system that we have in place. Um, so when we, we bring this forth, um, there shouldn't be a matter of, we'll do this and we'll work on the details later. Let's do this and work on the details now. So we're not you know, bringing forth Bill 21 for amendments in, in a year or two years and whenever things may change. And not all bad thing, things will change sometimes in society and maybe something's not applicable, so we need to do those kind of changes. But for the most part, there's a lot of legwork that can be done the first time a bill is introduced. So when we have Bill 21, for example, and we talk about penalizing, we need to do that as a deterrent. So that needs to be clear today. Um, coming out of the, the pandemic, Mr. Deputy Speaker, um, employers and employees all across Manitoba, and all across Canada for that matter, have had a struggle. So they've had a struggle to make and meet cost of living. And we can debate back and forth across party lines whether cost of living is what it means for, for a certain demographic in Manitoba versus another. But the fact of the matter is everybody was negatively affected. So the cost of living has risen for everybody. So when we talk about em em employees and trying to recruit and retain employees, we need to make it as easy as possible. Uh, and not to say we should be uh, kind of doing everything for the employee or for the employer, but let's make it easy, let's kind of meet halfway. So one of the questions that I asked was about the, the $200 application fee and who would be responsible for that. And, and the minister, I think, had made reference to the fact that, you know, if an employer really wanted an employee, they would help kind of make that happen. But the reality is sometimes that's not the case. And an employer may say, you know what, you bring this to me before we offer a job before we move forward on any kind of uh, interview process. So if that, let's say it's a first time employee or first time worker in the industry, may not have that ability, may not have that $200. And I know it may not seem like a lot in, in, the, in the grand scheme of things, but for some people it is. For some people that $200 application fee for this is the difference between walking into that interview versus I can't do this, I can't afford to it, and maybe their career passes them on. So that's something that, that we need to look at also. We can't just bring forward the legislation with no dollars to kind of back up and try and make it easy as, as possible for individuals to be able to get into that workforce. Uh, another question that, that, that I, I had asked about is the, um, the, uh, the, the penalties for, for not carrying your, your certificate or your fitness certificate, for example. And I understand that, that over the course of time, that's going to be the, the norm. People will take it maybe as part of their driver's license. Maybe there'll be a, a little addition on your driver's license that'll say, hey, I have this, fa this safety fitness certificate. But for the interim, that may not be the case. And people may need an adjustment period to be able to get um, kind of familiar with exactly how this works. So that, again, is something that needs to be clarified as well. Now, there can't just be something, we're going to do this, and penalized from day one if you go against what's in there. So, and it's not, it's not against the safety part of it. For me, that, that parameter is not about having and achieving the actual certificate. That's maybe physically carrying the certificate. That's not to say you don't have it, but the penalty for not having it. 
shouldn't be a penalty in, from day one because there needs to be an adjustment period for people to get used to be able to, to change themselves and, and acclimate themselves to be able to now carry another piece of information with them. Because people want to carry less and less as it goes on. For those of you that have had either a, a, a wallet or some kind of thing to keep all your identification or all your certificates or all your cards you need, it gets to be pretty thick after a while. So that's just something that maybe people need to get used to being able to have on them and there shouldn't be a penalty from day one. But Mr. Deputy Speaker, the, the premise and, and the idea behind this is about safety. And I think all across all party lines here in, in the chamber and across Manitoba, we can agree on the fact that the safety of Manitobans and the safety of our people on our roads is of the utmost importance. So again, with this piece of legislation, we support this. I still feel it could go a little bit further and we should be for all the, all the things that I just mentioned in the last few minutes, we could be able to make this a little bit stronger, but I believe on the premise, this is a very good start because the safety of Manitoba is what's important to all of us. Thank you. The Honourable Member for St. Boniface. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I, I recognize that I think a number of these changes are, are due to um, or the corrections that are happening as a result of uh, an Auditor General's report uh, into the oversight of commercial vehicle safety, um, there had been a, a steady increase in the number of um, in the number of accidents on our roads, including dangerous accidents in, involving commercial operators. Um, and uh, one is that the safety fitness program was deemed to be insufficient. One was that uh, there was no checking of operator safety knowledge or practices when. Uh, when first issuing safety fitness certificates. Uh, there was inadequate uh, follow-up uh, to poor safety performance. Uh, there wasn't enough focus on risk and operator improvement. And some of this is, is being addressed, and that is important because there was a point when it was really, uh, a, a, realistically speaking, our roads were not as safe as they ideally should have been, that um, when it came to um, on-road inspections, they said almost 50% of truck traffic is when uh, major way stations are closed, which meant that the way stations were completely missing um, trucks. As long as the, if a way station is open, obviously they're not going to be uh, analyzing anybody. And there were also challenges, even as mentioned, around uh, a pass-fail that um, uh, that essentially that a, a pass was not. Or, 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 so when, when safety uh, issues were discovered, they weren't always properly. Uh, recognized. So that is something that is uh, that is important. Uh, we're certainly pleased that these changes are being made. Um, it has been slow. I know that on the Public account, Accounts Committee uh, recently there was a point when only uh, when less than a third of the recommendations had, had been fully made. Uh, only 29% of the recommendations uh, had had fully been made. Um, and, and one of the issues again when we talk about uh, trucking in Manitoba, uh, it's 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 an industry where people are always in demand, and it's not simply that it's growing it's because there's a lot of turn and churn and turnover. Uh, so part of it is that uh, the drivers themselves, this is also about the protection of drivers themselves. I think we saw recently a case in, in Stonewall where there were um, uh, foreign temporary workers who were being very badly mistreated, uh, which, is, uh, which, which happens sometimes. It's really unfortunate. Uh, but it happened, um, so we need to make sure that there are protections like that as well as, as, far as, uh, as far as the safety of the operators are concerned. If the operators can't operate safely, then clearly their vehicle isn't safe and they're, they're, they're not safe on the road uh, as well. So we do see this as being uh, a series of positive steps, uh, always that there, there could be greater protections, certainly as far as temporary foreign workers are concerned, but uh, we will support this bill. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Okay. The question before the House is second reading of Bill Number 21, the Highway Traffic Amendment Act. Is it the pleasure of the House to adopt the motion? Agreed and so ordered. I declare the motion carried. We will now move as previously indicated to Bill 36, the Fair Registration Practices in Regulated Professions Amendment Act, the Honourable Minister of Labour and Immigration. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I move seconded by the Minister of Justice that Bill number 36 
the Fair Registrations, Practices and Regulated Professions Amendment Act, the law modifying the laws of the pratique. Inscription equitable dans les professions réglementées be now read a second time and be referred to the committee of this house. It has been moved by the Honourable Minister of Labour and Immigration, seconded by the Honourable Minister of Justice, that Bill Number 36, the Fair Registration Practices in Regulated Professions Amendment Act, be now read a second time and be referred to a committee of this House. The Honourable Minister of Labour and Immigration. Madam Speaker, I'm pleased to rise again to provide comments on Bill 36. Yes, Manitoba has labour mobility obligations under the Canadian Free Trade Agreement and the New West Partnership Trade Agreement. Manitoba's Labour Mobility Act underlines the province's commitment to full labour mobility in Canada by requiring all regulatory bodies to be compliant with all domestic trade agreements that Manitoba is a party to. Manitoba's Fair Registration Practices in Regulated Professions Act require self-regulating professions to comply with the CFTA and NWPTA. This bill is about extending, sorry, expanding government's statutory toolbox to foster and enforce more expedited labour mobility and fair registration. It addresses highly skilled labour shortages and competitive pressures in self-regulated registered professions. It intends to reduce, remove barriers faced by labour mobility applicants to our province by ensuring that they are tr treated fairly and their applications are processed in a timely manner. The bill also requires regulated professions to comply with statutory regulations with respect to English or French language proficiency testing requirements. This requirement is expected to reduce red tape and the financial burden for internationally educated applicants. These amendments empower the minister to, to issue compliance orders to regulated professions not compliant with labour mobility legislation. This bill further supports fairness legislation's requirement for self-regulated professions to ensure transparency, objectivity, impartiality, and fairness in their registration process, and is modeled after recent approaches in other provinces. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. A question period of up to 15 minutes will be held. Questions may be addressed to the Minister by any member in the following sequence. The first question by the official opposition critic or designate. Subsequent questions asked by critics or designates from other recognized opposition parties. Subsequent questions asked by each independent member. Remaining questions asked by any opposition member. And no question and no answer shall exceed 45 seconds. The floor is open for questions. The Honourable Member for Notre Dame. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I'd like to ask the Minister who was consulted when writing this bill. The Honourable Minister. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The 31 regulated professions in Manitoba under fairness legislation have been informed of this regulatory project. The Honourable Member for Tyndall Park. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can the minister advise if language proficiency testing is continually being reevaluated to meet the needs of future Manitobans looking to enter in-demand professional occupations, such as nurses and in-demand healthcare workers? The Honourable Minister. Our government is taking a leadership role with regards to language proficiency. Regular regulatory colleges are also responding to these, uh, the, this uh, to language proficiency as well. I can tell you, uh, with respect to the amendments, uh, this section requires that regular professions must not subject applicants to additional language tests if they already uh, meet this requirements. And that's the reason why for this amendment. Are there any other questions? The honourable member for Notre Dame. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I was just uh, wondering which. Uh, would this bill was written in response to any particular uh, regulated professional bodies? Like, was the government experiencing any difficulties with any particular regulated professional bodies? And if so, which ones? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, yes, there's been challenges with uh, internationally educated professionals uh, who are domestic applicants and other provinces coming to our province. 
Uh, we've had uh, a lot of conversations with uh, regulatory bodies, and uh, that is why uh, last year uh, the Minister of Health had to issue a letter of compliance to ensure that the regulatory bodies uh, complied uh, with those uh, issues uh, to ensure that these internationally educated professionals would be gainfully employed here in our province of Manitoba. The Honourable Member for Notre Dame. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, I would just like to know, um, because this bill does uh, speak about uh, proposed time limits for professional bodies to respond, I was just wondering what are current normal wait times for applications uh, to be reviewed currently? Um, if he, if the minister has any uh, current uh, numbers, especially for uh, the professions that we're seeking to help with our health human resource strategy. The Honourable Minister. Um, Mr. Deputy Speaker, what I can tell the member is that uh, what prompted these changes, uh, they're intended to remove barriers to labour mobility and make sure that the application requirements do not create disguised restrictions to labour mobility. Licence to licence recognition is in a place to ensure applicants do not face erroneous application processes that take a long time. Mobility applicants should not be required to complete reassessment of language, competency, education, training, or ability to practice if they have done so in another Canadian jurisdiction. The Honourable Member for Notre Dame. Just wondering, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, how is this government planning to address uh, other barriers faced by internationally trained workers? The Honourable Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, as I said before, uh, our government is taking a leadership role when it comes to streamlining the process with internationally educated professionals, in this case, in this bill, domestic applicants who are from other provinces. And what I can tell you as well is that uh, regulatory colleges are also responding to ensure that internationally educated professionals come to this province so that they can be gainfully employed uh, in our province uh, as soon as possible. Uh, the change underlines the province's commitments to full labour mobility in Canada and to ensure that Manitoba continues to have access to qualified licensed professionals. Are there any other questions? Seeing none, we will move from questions to debate. The floor is open for debate. The Honourable Member for Notre Dame. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, I was uh, very pleased to be able to attend the uh, briefing that was provided to me by the Minister and uh, the two different departments. Um, I was in attendance for that briefing and I was able to understand what this bill was really about. Um, I would, I'm happy to say that uh, you know this bill is needed and it's something that our uh, side of the house here is going to be pleased to support. Um, the main thrust of this bill is that what from my understanding is for for folks who are seeking to be registered um, in their professions here in Manitoba, especially for folks that are coming from other jurisdictions. Um, the provisions in this bill will indeed assist those folks that are going to be uh, seeking to be registered here in Manitoba, um, as long as they're coming from other jurisdictions um, in Canada. What this bill doesn't do, however, is provide much assistance for folks who are already in Manitoba, who are trying to seek, um, you know, a, a more barrier-free, unfair barriers to be free from unfair barriers to accreditation here in Manitoba. And so those barriers coming from other jurisdictions to come back into Manitoba, it's going to be okay. This, this bill is going to help with that. But again, for, for those folks that are experiencing barriers within Manitoba, we are still not adequately um, assisting them. And at this point, um, this bill you know, has its limitations and, and that's its main limitation. So uh, I would have to really speak about the things that still need to be done in order to get um, fairly registered here in Manitoba from many different professions. And I'm going to be focusing on 
um, nurses and on doctors today because as we know, um, we are experiencing um, a severe nursing crisis shortage throughout our province and we are also experiencing alarming uh, rates for doctor shortages across the province, especially for our rural, northern and remote areas. Um, if the government wanted to help, I think that we are in a process now, we are in a system now where it is in the public interest of the government to, to take a review of the different processes, especially um, that are happening in our health human resources and our professional bodies that accredit them. Um, when you take a look at a, a doctor shortage of over 400 to just get us to the national average um, for the number of doctors, to the fact that we are the lowest in Canada for the number of family physicians to uh, per capita to residents, or that we are the third lowest in Canada for number of specialists um, to in per capita to um, residents in Manitoba. These are really alarming rates, especially when we consider our aging population in rural and northern areas. We're hearing all these stories, and I just happen to know, uh, because of my background, so many internationally educated nurses and so many international medical graduates that really want to be part of the solution to this health human resource strategy here in Manitoba, but they're, you know, proverbially left out of the cold. If the government wanted to do um, so act um, as part of Section 20, 221 in the Regulated Health Professions Act, the minister and the cabinet already have the broad authority to make, approve, review regulations, and if necessary, to appeal or amend regulations if it is in the public interest. If it's not in the public interest now, I don't know what is, because we're hearing from our frontline healthcare workers that they really, really are experiencing a staffing shortage and that it does affect patient safety. We're seeing um, closures, we're seeing um, you know, the lack of, especially in our rural and northern areas, the fact that there's only 27 out of uh, 68 um, health centers that are only open part-time, and then 18 in this last few years that have been permanently closed. These are very serious conditions that our northern, rural, and remote areas are facing. And I do believe that this is time to act in the public interest to take a more concentrated and uh, focus and to have a, a greater partnership with our regulated, uh, with our regulators to, to try to uh, attend to these issues. And again, international medical graduates and internationally educated nurses want to be part of the solution, but they've been facing a lot of barriers, whether it's to, due to cost or even just um, other types of unfair barriers. When you take a look at the uh, CRNM, or College of Registered Nurses of Manitoba registration data report that was provided to us in December 2021, um, you're taking a look at the 2011 to 2020 rates of registration of internationally educated nurses and how successful they are or they weren't in trying to apply to become nurses here. We're seeing that over that time period, more than 60% of them uh, were not able to get registered for various reasons. And for those that were able to get registered, it took an average time of two and a half years before they were able to get registered to work here in the province. And I certainly know of many nurses that it took four years or even more. So there is something wrong here when we have this, these type of statistics. Again, from that same uh, report, the CRNM registration data report, we're seeing that even the num this really uh, downward trend of successful applicants over this 2011 to 2020 period, and then even with that, 
the number of immigrants with nursing backgrounds coming to our province, we had a high of about, it was increasing from 2011 to 2014, and it got up to almost 400 um, nurses that were coming into Manitoba until it went down to 49 in 2019 and 2020, uh, it went down to 19. 19 immigrants coming to Manitoba with a nursing background. I, I was aware of a social media campaign that was called um, Anywhere But Manitoba. So for nurses to go anywhere but Manitoba. And if you take a look at what was going on um, in these registration practices and the types of unfair various accreditation that folks were experiencing, it was really no wonder why that uh, people were trying to go anywhere but Manitoba. I know of nurses that actually would prefer to go to Quebec, have to learn French, have to pass things in French before they would actually come and do that here in Manitoba. It was uh, almost that ridiculous. So um, if you take a look at uh, internationally educated nurses accreditation processes from other provinces, you'll see why everybody is leaving Manitoba um, and doing their accreditation process elsewhere. Um, in Ontario, a nurse would have to pass her NCLEX. It's called the uh, National Council Licensure Examination for Registered Nurses. And then they would have to go through a paid supervised practice experience partnership, kind of like a mentorship um, where, where you're doing the experience of working in a health center under su paid supervision. In Nova Scotia, you have to do this NCLEX, this uh, main board exam, and then you also have to pay, uh, pass language proficiencies. Okay, but here in Manitoba, we have to do all of those, plus we need to pass um, or go through uh, another test called the clinical competency assessment, which takes four days. You can't uh, prepare for it, you can't review for it and um, that's extra costs. And on top of that, you still have to go through more bridging programs um, that can take anywhere up to two years. So, of course, the, our nurses here are not going to stay here. They're gonna go to another province where the process is easier. And then after that, we can use this bill that the minister um, has suggested and that we will be passing today because then everybody's going to be coming back to Manitoba if uh, they have some kind of tie to Manitoba. So my suggestion is that we take a look at this process. This bill that we're going to be passing today is again making it easier for folks to come back to Manitoba once they've already um, you know, gone, done, done, done their accreditation process elsewhere. But what is it that's happening here in Manitoba that we need to drive people out of province first to go through their accreditation processes and then after that use this bill to make it easier to make them come back here. It seems extremely convoluted and um, considering our, uh, what we're experiencing here in our province, especially in northern, rural and remote areas where we have these uh, doctor and nursing shortages, it really behooves this minister and our health minister and this cabinet to take this section 221 of the Regulated Health Professions Act seriously and see what is it here that we need to do the, to take, to, we already have the broad authority to make, approve, review these regulations or to appeal and amend regulations if it is in the public interest. Now, I am just a politician. I am not uh, a nurse and I am not somebody from the colleges and I am not, I'm one of the least people that are gonna be authorized or have the experience to make these proper decisions about what constitutes safety. Um, and, and all those things that we really need to uh, take into account for coming up with um, th this process to make sure that we have uh, you know, the most skilled nurses and that we have um, patient safety as our priority here in this province. But at the same time, I really need to point out here that what's going on in Manitoba is really not working. So throwing money at the issue is one thing that may or may not work, but what we're seeing, what I'm hearing from advocates, is that our Manitoba IENs 
aren't even taking that Manitoba IEN grant, that $23,000 that they can apply for as a grant. So, and, and that's serious. You have an ability to take a grant, $23,000, so that you can do your Manitoba registration process here, but you don't take that $23,000 because you know that you may not pass or you know it's gonna take really long to do this here, so you're gonna go to another province and do it there. They're not even taking the money. That's what we're hearing from advocates. So there's so much that work that needs to be done. Yes, we will pass this, um, this legislation that the minister has brought forth today because it is making it easier for those folks that would maybe return to return here and practice here in Manitoba, but there is something going on here that we really need to address in Manitoba. Why are these people not wanting to go through the registration process here? Um, <clears throat> and I would leave it to the minister, to the cabinet, to really take a long, hard look at the, at the registration rates that we're seeing, the decline that we're seeing in these registration rates from our IENs, from our immigration rates that we're seeing, the decline in those rates for folks that have this nursing background. And today I did speak about the international medical graduates. Um, there are a whole host of different kinds of things that we can do to try to make it um, easier for international medical graduates to join uh, our province and join the ranks of doctors here. And we, the stories that I hear sometimes, the stories that I hear sometimes, and I'll just share one because I know we need to wrap up. There's this one uh, international medical graduate that I met recently. He was an ophthalmologist and a surgeon. Um, he used to treat uh, folks in the Canadian Embassy when he lived there in the Philippines. Yet the next week when he was here in Manitoba, you know, he's not a doctor anymore, so he's not qualified to treat anybody here. He had to tell himself at the airport on his way here, remember, I am not a doctor anymore. Remember, I am not a doctor. I am not a doctor anymore. When, when I leave this airport and I go to Manitoba, I am not a doctor anymore. And, you know, he has his children with him and his family, and they come here, and now he's working at a call center, and he's been working at this call center for quite a while. This is somebody who we could certainly use, knowing what the, uh, the rates of folks who need especially eye surgeons and eye doctors, especially in northern, rural, and remote areas, he's willing to work in these types of places. But what kind of immigration system and what kind of uh, regulatory colleges system do we have here in Manitoba that somebody like that has to talk to themselves in that way before coming to our province? So there's so much more that we can do. This bill before us is, you know, tinkering at the edges for trying to help people to come back once they realize they can't do this here in Manitoba, but there is a lot here that we can do, that we must do in order to help address our health human resources uh, strategy that we really need to work on if we're gonna get to the bottom of, you know, trying to help this aging population that's coming up. Thank you for the time. The Honorable Member for Tin, oh. The Honourable Government House Leader on House Business. On House Business, I'm just looking to revise the order of which uh, government business uh, proceeds this afternoon. Could you please uh, call in this order, second reading of Bill 36, 11, 34, 32, and then debate on second readings of Bill 35 and number 6, and second readings on 13 and 31, and uh, Bill number 7. It has been announced that second. the House will deal with the following business this afternoon. Second reading of bills 36, 11, 34, 32. Debate on second reading of bills 35 and 6. Second reading of bill 13 and 31. And debate on second reading of bill 7. The hour being 4 p.m. I am now interrupting to debate to deal with second reading for the remaining government specified bills as per rule 2 bracket 10. There is to be no further debate or amendment beyond what is provided in Rule 2, bracket 10. The House shall sit until midnight and may sit beyond midnight only with unanimous consent. 
In accordance with our rules, all matters of privilege and points of order are deferred until after these actions have been concluded. The bills will be called in the order as announced by the government house leader. These remaining specified bills are 36, 11, 34, 32, 35, 13, 31, 7 for today. Well, then I'll start over and read the whole list of specified bills. Um, 36 to be uh, concluded, then 11, 34, 32, 35, 6, 10, 13. The remaining specified bills are 36, 11, 34, 32, 35, 6, 13, 31, 7, 10, 23, 26, 29, 2, and 24. For bills that have not been previously called for debate, the following actions will take place on each bill. The minister will move the second reading motion and then have up to 10 minutes to speak and debate. A question period of up to 15 minutes may occur following which the official opposition critic and independent liberals will each have up to 10 minutes to speak. Upon conclusion of these remarks, the speaker will put the question on the bill. For each bill that has previously been called for debate, the remaining steps in the process will be concluded. This includes completing the question period on the bill, followed by debate remarks from the official opposition critic and the independent liberal members. Following that, the question will be put. I will now recognize the Honourable Member for Tyndall Park to address second reading of Bill Number 36. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker, for the opportunity to rise this afternoon and put a few words on record about Bill 36, the Fair Registration Practices in Regulated Professions Amendment Act. Uh, Madam Speaker, it's hard not to think about this legislation and debate this legislation and not think about the health care shortages that we have in the province. And health care shortages come from a wide array of different issues, but for the sake of this legislation, one of the reasons our province is under such pressure right now is because we have health care workers here in the province of Manitoba who are trained to work, who want to work, but are not being allowed to work. And I think that this piece of legislation is a positive step because at the very least it allows for us to begin debating it here inside of the Manitoba chambers. And we are going to be supporting the legislation because I do think it's important to move forward. But there are many Manitobans still living here in Winnipeg throughout the province who have been wanting to leave the province especially throughout the pandemic because they are trained in our health care field and they actually they want to contribute to health care at such a dire time and we've done very very little to help enable this to help ensure that those wanting to contribute to our health care system actually have the opportunity to do so and again I think this piece of legislation is a step a positive step forward, um, but it's just scratching the surface, Madam Speaker. And I'd, I'd like to compare us to other provinces. And we know that recently Ontario legislated changes to allow for Canadian healthcare workers who are already registered or licensed in another Canadian jurisdiction to begin practicing in Ontario immediately without having uh, first having to register with one of the regulatory colleges. Madam Speaker, we could be debating ideas such as this. We know in the BC government, um, they announced bursaries for internationally educated nurses last year and since funding was announced about 5,000 people expressed an interest in nursing in BC and again we have to be competitive with the other provinces Madam Speaker we need to give health care workers workers who we desperately need right now incentive and reason to stay in our province this legislation could move further 
um, or could further expand to include international mobility licensing and improving international qualification recognition. You know, last month I asked the Minister of Labour and Immigration during question period why nurses and physicians are not listed as in-demand occupations in Manitoba despite a critical shortage of healthcare workers in our province. That list to this day has still not been updated, Madam Speaker. We know that these careers, these jobs are in demand, yet it's not being listed as in demand. We need to be looking at better bridging programs for internationally trained healthcare workers, and that means looking at how we can use our already established Manitoba Provincial Nominee Program immigration routes to support attraction of internationally trained skilled workers in healthcare fields. And we need to be reevaluating language requirements to ensure that the requirements are attainable for in demand high skilled workers here in the province of Manitoba. Uh, with those few words, Madam Speaker, I'm looking forward to further debate. Thank you. Is the House ready for the question? The question before the House is second reading of Bill Number 36, the Fair Registration Practices in Regulated Professions Amendment Act. Is it the pleasure of the House to adopt the motion? Agreed? Agreed and so ordered. I declare the motion carried. I will now call for a second reading of Bill Number 11, the Reducing Red Tape and Improving Services Act 2023. The Honourable Minister of Justice. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. I move seconded by the Minister of Transportation that Bill Number 11, the Reducing Red Tape and Improving Services Act 2023, be now read a second time and be referred to a committee of this House. It has been moved by the Honourable Minister of Justice, seconded by the Honourable Minister of Transportation, that Bill No. 11, the Reducing Red Tape and Improving Services Act 2023, be now read a second time and be referred to a committee of this House. The Honourable Minister of Justice. Thank you, Madam Speaker. This is an omnibus bill. Omnibus, not ominous, uh, because it is uh, fairly routine in terms of the uh, issues that it deals with, and I'll try to run through with them relatively Quickly. I only mention uh, this omnibus because it has a lot of other departments that aren't uh, related to the Department of Justice, and so while I can try to provide um, some detail when questions are asked, if there are any questions, I may have to defer some of the details to committee until the relevant departments uh, are conferred with. However, this bill um, amends the Amuse Amusements Act. Uh, which will eliminate the prohibition of reselling tickets at markup. The prohibition on reselling tickets is no longer effective in addressing the rapidly evolving online secondary ticket marketplace. Similarly, the prohibition limits the availability uh, and the ability of Manitoba companies to provide secondary ticket sales services and compels Manitobans to rely on services from outside the province and grey market. Manitoba is the only province that restricts what a secondary ticket seller can charge. A further amendment is to the City of Winnipeg Charter and the City of Winnipeg Charter Amendment and Planning Amendment Act, uh, and it will be amended to permit planning notices to be sent electronically. The City of Winnipeg Charter Amendment and Planning Amendment Act requires the City of Winnipeg to give the owner of real property written notice to be delivered by ordinary mail. A change was made to the Planning Act in 2018 that enables municipalities outside the City of Winnipeg to choose whether to communicate through ordinary mail, in person, or through electronic communication with consent. The City of Winnipeg has requested similar legislative changes that will provide the City with the same communications options as other municipalities in the province. The City of Winnipeg indicates that the requirement to send notices via ordinary mail affects their ability to approve services and reduces review times for various permits. The Highway Traffic Act is amended to provide paramedics and emergency medical responders the same authority as firefighters to direct traffic. The HTA does not currently allow paramedics to control traffic at an emergency scene on a roadway. However, as members know, paramedics are often the first or only emergency responders at a scene, especially in rural areas. In such situations, paramedics need to direct traffic in order to establish a safe zone in which to work. The amendments will give paramedics the authority to control traffic in situations where police are not present or under the direction of the police, which is the same authority to control traffic that firefighters currently have under the HTA. In addition, the HTA Highway Traffic Act currently allows emergency vehicles and 
any other type of vehicle carrying rescue or first aid equipment to contravene certain traffic rules such as speeding and proceeding through red lights. The amendments will remove this outdated provision to ensure that only emergency vehicles operated by a driver with a class 4 license are allowed to disobey traffic rules when responding to an emergency. The proposed amendments do not impact volunteer or part-time or on-call firefighters, including those in rural Manitoba. Finally, the Teachers' Pension Act uh, is amended to allow the Teachers' Retirement uh, Allowances Fund, uh, sometimes called TRAF, uh, allow their board to set its own board procedures and adopt forms to be used for administration of the Teachers' Retirement Allowances Fund. The TRAF board has requested the Department of Education and Early Childhood Learning to make these changes to allow for enhanced flexibility in the frequency and scheduling of their board meetings and to remove the requirement that their operational forms be prescribed by regulation. Uh, those are the, um, the amendments that are made in this uh, Reduction of Red Tape Act, and I look forward to answering the questions I can and responding to others at committee. I... A question period of up to 15 minutes will be held. Questions may be addressed to the minister by any opposition or independent member in the following sequence. First question by the official opposition critic or designate. Subsequent questions asked by critics or designates from other recognized opposition parties. Subsequent questions asked by each independent member and remaining questions asked by any opposition members and no question or answer shall exceed 45 seconds. The Honourable Member for the Maples. Speaker. Uh, as Minister mentioned, uh, there were four different uh, acts are amended. I was just wondering uh, why all those four put into a one bill? The Honourable Minister of Justice. I thank the member for the question. So there's two kinds of bills like this. One is the Minor Amendments and Corrections Act, which are smaller changes, uh, often typographical changes that show up in, a, in an act that deal with a variety of different departments. Uh, these are red tape reductions, so they're, they're not significant enough always to have their own standalone bill, uh, but they do things that make things more effective and they show up in the red tape reductions bill. The Honourable Member for Tyndall Park. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Can the Minister explain whether it was considered that eliminating the probation on scalping might be a disincentive towards participants and fans being able to attend amusement events such as games and concerts? The Honourable Minister of Justice. I thank the member for the question. I'm sure that she'll know that already um, there are many secondary ticket providers. I won't name them all, but she can uh, Google them. Uh, and uh, many Manitobans access secondary tickets uh, online uh, in that way. And they're often sold at a price that's higher. The problem is that you can't really regulate uh, that. You can't really have protection for fans because they're all out of province and they're not subject to Manitoba regulation. Um, allowing Ticketmaster and, uh, and those that are located in Manitoba to be able to do that allows the Minister to ensure that there is uh, fan protection. The Honourable Member for the Maples. Does the government agree that their Bill 37, the Planning Amendment and City of Winnipeg Charter Amendment Act was a bad idea that added red tape for municipalities? Honourable Minister of Justice. Well, in fact, as a member uh, would know from my comments, the City of Winnipeg has asked for these particular changes in, uh, in this act. If he believes that the changes are a bad idea, he may want to phone up uh, Mayor Gillingham or his local council and ask why they've re recommended and asked for these changes. The Honourable Member for the Maples. I just also like to maybe ask the Minister to provide some uh, information who he consulted when he drafted this bill. The Honourable Minister of Justice. Uh, in particular, with that amendment that the member just asked a question about, uh, the City of Winnipeg asked for the amendment, so it was the City of Winnipeg. Any further questions? If not, debate is open. The Honourable Member for the Maples. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, recently, we had a chance to sit down with uh, True North and Ticketmaster to see what their uh, thinking is uh, regarding the Amusement Act Amendment. And, uh, they even uh, 
ask us uh, for the support of this bill. But then they also uh, told us, you know, there, there's a way to protect the consumers. And uh, they have provided us a list uh, to bring in, especially first off, uh, Manitoba Tech uh, Sales Act, which is, uh, if you look at an uh, BC or you look at an Ontario, they do have uh, those acts. And uh, there's a penalties, and there's even, I think in BC, one is a prison a term if you don't follow those laws. So what uh, the True No Authentic Master were asking for is, they were asking the ban of use of software bots, which was designate, designed to circumvent online security measures cut to the front of the line and steal tickets. So again, this is a really good idea to actually ban bots, uh, and uh, this was uh, True North and uh, Tech Masters asked. And they also asked us, uh, like they provided us a list of uh, what else need to be brought into a act. It is also provided a private spectacular ticket hosting which uh, deceive fans into paying high prices for ticket not even on sale yet. So like people will uh, post uh, some of these tickets, even if you look at the Jets ticket, they weren't even, even on uh, online, uh, like they weren't even selling it, but uh, there were some uh, out of province or you can call out of country uh, sites uh, that they were selling the tickets, even though they never had those tickets. So consumer is not protected in that cases. They were also asking bring a ticket reselling out of black market with a strong new consumer protection, such as mandatory money back guarantee for all resold tickets. Disclosure of exact seat location and information. Transaction in Canadian dollars only. Transparency in pricing through upfront pricing of fees and taxes. So we want to make sure sometimes you see at the first page, let's say just ticket, season ticket, or no playoff tickets, like they were posting for $100. If you go to the third or fourth pages, there's probably $70 or $80 taxes. But with this, uh, but the tech master is asking, put everything front so uh, consumer know when somebody's buying the ticket, they know exactly what the price will be. Uh, display of ticket refund policies in the event of, of event cancellation ban deceptive marketing like the unsectioned use of names, logos of teams, artists, and venue on reselling website to confuse consumers. And this is exactly they were telling us, they have even showed us uh, when they were showing the, even though Jets text weren't on sale, but there were some sites, they had a logo, a Jets logo, and uh, they were trying to say this is uh, a, looks like a real Jets site where you can buy the tickets. They also asked us a consider a requirement for a reseller to register with the Provincial Consumer Protection Authority to clarify that they do not use deceptive practices, software, parts, and require payment and local tax, and pay local taxes. So that's really important. Keeping uh, money in Manitoba, Madam Speaker, and uh, this is where currently we know that if it's uh, out of province or out of country sites, they don't pay taxes. And they also amended uh, the City of Winnipeg Charter. Uh, the, the City of Winnipeg Charter and the City of Winnipeg Charter Amendment and Planning Amendment Act are amended to permit planning notice to be sent electronically. I guess the third one is the Highway Traffic Act. The Highway Traffic Act is amended to give pra uh, paramedics and emergency medical responders the same authority as firefighters to direct traffic and eliminate a exemption that allowed vehicle other than emergency vehicles to disregard speed limits, stop signals, other traffic control devices at carrying first aid or rescue equipment. And the fourth one was the Teachers' Pension Act. 
The Teacher's Pension Act is amended to allow the teacher's retirement allowance fund board to set its own board procedures and adopt form to be used for administration of the teacher's retirement allowance fund. Madam Speaker, again, as I should ask earlier, I think uh, Minister or even mentioned it that there is uh, there's the four different departments uh, that they brought everything into one bill. If we really look at it, uh, uh, as the question was on Bill 37, was this uh, asked by the municipalities? No, A even AMM said, no, we don't need this bill, but uh, this government still brought that bill forward where they have uh, taken the rights from those uh, elected officials and pin, uh, put those uh, decision making to some of those uh, that not even elected members. So that was, that's, that's creating more red tape, uh, Madam Speaker. That's not reducing the red tape. And even as you think about it, uh, PCs have always picked a fight with the cities, if you think about it. Um, they have cut 50-50 funding for the transit, and uh, which is a fact. And they also froze the funding for the seven, seven years in a row, uh, Madam Speaker. That's uh, also uh, even AMM. Uh, this was our, actually, NDP's uh, first uh, election promise. Uh, and I think there's only 170 days left till elections. and. Uh, that was one of our promises, and uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's the PCs uh, that uh, have to follow uh, the NDP, what they're doing now. So, and uh, there's another, Madam Speaker, is just, uh, is election year now. And the PCs will promise the moon to everyone. But will they deliver it? Maybe not. Have they delivered for the last seven years? No, they haven't. There's always announcements, announcements, and announcements. Is there any, they are always have underspent even on highways. With this few uh, comment, uh, Madam Speaker, I'll give the floor, I think, uh, to my colleague from Tyndall Park, and uh, she may want to put a few words on this one too. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honorable Member for Tyndall Park. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker, and I'm happy to rise and be able to share a few words about Bill 11, the Reducing Red Tape and Improving Services Act. Now, it, it's difficult to debate any piece of legislation when there's four very different and important topics all being thrown into one. It doesn't really give the other pieces of legislation the benefit of the doubt here, Madam Speaker. For example, I know there's a large piece of legislation about the Retired Teachers Association, TRAF, and all of us here in this House have actually done a lot of work to support TRAF. We, we recently passed legislation for TRAF, and of course, we all want them to be allowed to set up their own board procedures. So we're very much in favor of this, Madam Speaker, but it's hard to support a piece of legislation that if we choose to support that, we are also choosing to support the resale of tickets. And these are tickets for concerts, tickets for games. I know many members of these house enjoy going to Winnipeg Jets games. It's getting very exciting. We're in the playoffs now, Madam Speaker. Yesterday, tomorrow is going to actually be our first playoff game. And I'm sure many members of this house are going to be watching it, whether we're here in the chambers somehow on their devices, or uh, maybe we'll get out a little bit early tomorrow so we can be going to the whiteout parties ourselves, Madam Speaker. But for these games, for these concerts, we, by implementing legislation such as this, we're actually encouraging people to resell tickets. We're encouraging those who can afford to buy Order. and then go and resell these tickets to those who might not be able to afford to buy the new tickets at the listed price. So it's difficult, Madam Speaker, and I, would, I wish that the government would bring forward legislation giving merit to each piece of the legislation. Again, there's four pieces. My colleague from the Maples actually spoke very well to the four different pieces. And it would be nice to give each piece of legislation its due. And they deserve it, Madam Speaker. Uh, with those few words, though, we'll continue on with debate. Thank you. The question before the House is a second reading of Bill Number 11, the Reducing Red Tape and Improving Services Act 2023. Is it the pleasure of the House to adopt the motion? Agreed? Agreed. 
Agreed and so ordered. I declare the motion carried. I will now call second reading of Bill Number 34, the Police Services Amendment Act. The Honourable Minister of Justice. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. I move seconded by the Minister of Education that Bill Number 34, the Police Services Amendment Act, be now read a second time and referred to a committee of this House. It has been moved by the Honourable Minister of Justice, seconded by the Honourable Minister of Education, that Bill No. 34, the Police Services Amendment Act, be now read a second time and be referred to a committee of this House. The Honourable Minister of Justice. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. There are significant changes happening when it comes to um, policing in, uh, in Manitoba. Significant and long overdue uh, changes to improve the safety of Manitoba communities. Uh, this bill amends um, and continues to um, proceed with changes that were previously introduced by allowing for a new layered public safety delivery model, including enhancements to community and First Nation safety officer programs. Included in these amendments are establishing the general policing services to be provided by every police service in Manitoba. So as an example, Madam Speaker, there are a number of different municipal policing agencies. Uh, members will know them. And, in, uh, of course, Winnipeg, Brandon, St. Anne, uh, Morden, and there are others throughout the province of Manitoba. But ensuring that there is a, um, a general uh, level of services that must be provided by those uh, municipal forces is important uh, to ensure that there is a level of expectation in terms of the services that a police service will provide to their community. Uh, going further than that, it will require that police services provide specialized policing services, major crimes investigations, uh, dog, uh, police dog services in accordance with provincial standards. So while you have um, a set level of standards for every municipality, there are then a variety of different specialized services that police agencies often provide. As I mentioned, uh, major crimes investigations which are different. Uh, and more complex, obviously, in terms of evidence gathering than most um, most uh, things that our police are dealing with. Specialized services like the dog or canine unit. And while it's why it's important to have standards in place for these areas is that they really do require specialized training. But we also know that not every municipality will be large enough. Their police force won't be large enough to provide those specialized training. And it's not the intention of this bill, uh, and this has been uh, come about with wide consultation. It's not the intention of this bill to stop municipal police forces from operating quite the opposite, just simply putting in baseline standards um, and then requiring certain uh, specialized police services have uh, standards as well. But for those smaller municipalities who can't provide those specialized services, it'll require the RCMP, the provincial police force, to provide specialized services to police services that cannot provide those services in accordance with these standards. So it's an assurance that those smaller municipalities that can't provide those specialized services, they'll be able to rely upon the RCMP for those services. The bill also uh, is removing the requirement for the police service uh, of jurisdiction to enter into an agreement with the Manitoba and a municipality or First Nations to establish a uh, safety officer program. It expands the role of community and First Nations safety officers to provide an initial response to public safety issues in their community and to detain individuals until such a time as the police service or jurisdiction can attend at the scene. And it does so by providing the safety officers with a clear peace officer status and protections and authorizing the safety officers to enforce an expanded range of provincial statutes and additional administrative and logistical support to police agencies in criminal and non-criminal matters. So we've heard from many different jurisdictions that it's difficult um, to get a sufficient level of policing. Some of that is a recruitment issue, potentially with the RCMP. Some of it is that police officers are busy doing a number of other things. So the clearest example I can give you, Madam Speaker, um, are the, the the, uh, the public uh, call for more safety on buses, on transit. So Mayor Gillingham, during his election campaign, ran on the promise to have a bus safety transit unit. Uh, those would not necessarily be Winnipeg Police Service uh, agents or uh, police, WPS officers. And so we needed to ensure that community safety officers 
could have the ability to arrest and to detain with peace officer status so that the city can create that bus safety unit with these community safety officers. That's what this bill does. It'll allow the city to go forward once it passes to have those individuals in place uh, and then to be able to be on the buses if that's what the city chooses to do. Ultimately, they're the employers of these um, community safety officers, but they needed to be provided with the powers to do that. Now, looking beyond the city of Winnipeg, uh, First Nations and uh, rural communities have also asked for uh, more individuals to be able to look at maybe Highway Traffic Act uh, enforcement or other things in rural municipalities. Uh, and this isn't just because of uh, potentially a shortage of RCMP officers, although it's part of that, um, but police agencies, RCMP and others have said there are certain things that they don't feel that police necessarily have to do, that they don't have to do certain uh, functions. And if they were relieved of those functions, they could do more investigation uh, into crimes. They could do more proactive policing. And we hear that a lot, that the public would like to see more proactive policing. So the creation of these more enhanced community safety and First Nations safety officers will allow for that to happen. But none of this can happen unless there's proper training and standards. So I spoke a bit about the standards that are being put in place, but the training is critically important. It's one of the reasons why last year we hired Devon Clunas, a former Winnipeg, City of Winnipeg Chief of Police, uh, to be involved with the creation of unified training standards across the province so that those who are involved in, um, in law enforcement would get a set level and a standardized training. Um, that isn't always the case. Often we have officers who have to leave the province or there isn't the same level of training. It's very important that there's an expectation that where you have layered policing as an example, uh, that the training is sufficient, that it meets the expectations that the public would have. So we're meeting a number of different pieces of expectation from the public. A desire to have more individuals who are in the communities who can enforce certain things, to have more presence, to allow the police to do other sort of things. Uh, but also to ensure that those individuals are properly trained. So all of this sort of comes together uh, with the work that is happening. People might hear different pieces of it and wonder how it all fits together. It fits together with uh, standards throughout Manitoba in terms of what our expectation is of municipal police forces. It then provides individuals who are maybe outside uh, those municipal police forces to do certain kinds of policing, like we might see on the buses, but then it requires training. And so that work is underway as well. So there's a lot going on when it comes to policing in the province of Manitoba, but it all leads to a, uh, a better uh, policing system, safer communities, and trying to meet the expectations of the public when it comes to community safety. So with those words, I look forward to questions from uh, the Honourable Critic, uh, the member for Concordia, and seeing this bill pass. A question period of up to 15 minutes will be held. Questions may be addressed to the minister by any opposition or independent member in the following sequence. First question by the official opposition critic or designate. Subsequent questions asked by critics or designates from other recognized parties. Um, subsequent questions asked by each independent member. And no question or answer shall exceed 45 seconds. The Honourable Member for Tyndall Park. Oh, sorry. The Honourable Member for Concordia. Uh, thank you very much, um, uh, Madam Speaker. <clears throat> I'd like to ask the Minister um, what additional resources will be offered to uh, municipalities, other levels of government, other groups that want to uh, uh, start offering policing services that would be enabled under Bill 34? The Honourable Minister of Justice. I thank the Member for the question. He'll know that uh, this government provided a record increase of funding for municipalities across the province uh, in this most recent budget, uh, which he voted against, uh, as an aside. Um, but of course, as we, um, as we go ahead and bring forward um, the CSOs and First Nations police officers, of course, we can have more discussions about resources, but he should rest assured uh, in the knowledge that there was record funding for municipalities this year. The Honourable Member for Tyndall Park. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. In reference to standardized policing services, can the Minister go into a bit more detail as to what types of policing services are to be standardized? The Honourable Minister of Justice. I mean, they would be the most basic uh, um, policing services that communities would expect when it comes to general uh, patrol, follow-up of, of uh, not major uh, investigations, ensuring that there is 
uh, particular standards when it comes to how to engage in a um, high-speed chase, uh, as an example. Uh, this is not an unusual sort of thing. So if you look in British Columbia online, they will have a number of different um, requirements that uh, police need to engage in in terms of standardized um, uh, operations when they're responding to certain things. Honourable Member for Concordia. What is the status of the work that's being done with First, uh, First Nations to ensure that uh, they have the resources available uh, to establish these um, uh, additional, uh, uh, additional uh, uh, opportunities in their communities for uh, community safety? The Honourable Minister of Justice. No, it's a very good question and one that I hope all members can agree that we need to ensure that policing on First Nations communities is an essential service. Uh, and we have certainly engaged with the federal government, as other provinces have, to said that we need to expand the funding when it comes to First Nations policing so that it doesn't just apply to uh, a relatively small number of our First Nations communities in Manitoba, but that it can be broadened to all of them. We have the full support of Manitoba's Grand Chiefs in that call, and we continue to ask the federal government to ensure it's an essential service and fund it as such. Any further questions? If not, the uh, question before the House is second read. Oh, sorry. Uh, I liked it outgoing. <laughs> I did too. <laughs> uh, this question period then having been ended, the uh, floor is open for debate. The Honourable Member for Concordia. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I appreciate it. Well, I appreciate the words, uh, the opportunity to put a few words on the record uh, with regards to uh, Bill 34, Police Services Amendment Act. Uh, we know that this bill uh, makes a number of amendments to the Police Services Act that deal with the provision of policing services, specifically general policing services, specialized investigation, and specialized police services. The following, uh, as we understand them, are the key changes that are proposed under this bill. Uh, will allow the Director of Policing to establish standards respecting police services, facilities and equipment, gives Criminal Intelligence Director charge over creating standards dealing with criminal intelligence. It allows the police, uh, Manitoba Police Commission to monitor police uh, uh, service compliance with policing standards. Uh, police service is able to provide specialized policing service or conduct specialized investigations only if the police service meets the required standards. Per a uh, police service does not uh, require, uh, does not meet these required standards. The Royal Canadian Mounted Police or other police service must provide the needed service or investigation. Bill 34 also expands the role of community safety officers, First Nations uh, safety officers, enables them to provide initial response to situations that threaten the safety of citizens before the arrival of the police. The uh, community officers and First Nations safety officers may also provide logistical and administrative support to local police on criminal and non-criminal matters. And lastly, Bill 34 allows two or more municipalities to operate jointly as a regional community safety officer program. These changes, uh, Madam Speaker, uh, are certainly changes that we know have been asked for by AMM, by municipalities across this province, as I've had an opportunity to travel, speak with uh, many municipalities. Uh, certainly these changes, I think, uh, will meet some of the requirements that they have. Uh, what, I, what I would note, though, uh, Madam Speaker, and uh, couldn't have been more evident in the uh, Minister's uh, opening statement and answers to the questions, was that while this bill allows for communities to establish uh, community safety officers, to uh, bring in some of that, uh, that additional, uh, some of these additional tools to uh, deal with the, uh, the, the community safety within their uh, municipalities. Ultimately, this bill offers no additional resources to those communities. And so while the minister may uh, you know, talk a good game, he uh, certainly isn't uh, bringing any kind of substantial resources that communities have been asking for. And, you know, I'm sure at this point they're scrambling, right? The, the government is in full panic mode because they realize that now it's seven years after being elected and violent crime has gotten worse under their watch. Things are worse than they've ever been. That's certainly been the, uh, the experience from uh, what we've heard in, in AMM sessions across, again, across the province here in the city of Winnipeg. Survey after survey shows that people are more 
uh, afraid and are more concerned about crime and safety in their communities and personal safety. And so while people have been telling us this for seven years that things had continued to get worse under the PCs, they realize, they look back and they realize, uh-oh, we have actually made it worse. We've actually taken steps that have made community safety worse. So, you know, as I said, the municipalities are a great example. Uh, you know, for seven, for, uh, seven sub subsequent budgets or, or uh, budgets in a row, there were cuts or freezes to municipalities across this province. And so municipalities were saying, we need to, uh, to make sure that our communities are safe. We need to hire more officers. And the province said no at every single turn. And now, in election year, of course, they'll say anything and they'll come out and they'll say, well, there's more money than ever. Just trust us, there'll be more money than ever. But we know that those cuts have had a serious impact. We know that as we brought in this house, time after time, about the concerns around the RCMP settlement, and the additional uh, uh, impact that's going to have on municipalities, this government did nothing. This government stood by and did nothing and refused to be a partner with the municipalities on this issue and continues to leave them uh, out in, uh, in the cold and not allow them uh, some kind of certainty when it comes to community safety and policing in their communities. We know that the Northern, uh, Northern Air uh, Service has impacted justice in the North. And I know that you know if we had the opportunity, members of uh, this caucus would bring forward those concerns that they're hearing firsthand from their constituents about impacts of crime and safety in the north and how our court systems cannot operate when the uh when the uh the air service isn't allowing for it so this has been the legacy of this government privatized air service that has impacted them we know that crown prosecutors have uh, sounded the alarm that uh, they uh, are are understaffed that they aren't able to keep up again the legacy of this uh provincial government uh, you know, and the list goes on. The same program, uh, Madam Speaker, we brought up time and time again, the impacts that that has across the entire justice system has happened under this government's watch. You know, and, and if, if this government's record on the institutional safety officers is any indication as to what the, this bill will do and, and the, you know, the, the panacea that they believe that now this will be, all we have to do is look at the ISO program and see how this government announced something, promised something, said a bunch of words, and then walked away and did nothing for four years. For four years, they did nothing. And now uh, we know that in the healthcare system, you know, nurses are sounding the alarm. So this is the same kind of thing, Madam Speaker, where it's all these big announcements, all these big promises. Of course, in an election year, of course, in an election year, they're going to say absolutely anything to get elected. But we know what their record has been. And we know that the, uh, that the cuts that they've made across the board, whether it be in housing, whether it be in po uh, with regards to poverty, whether it be addictions, right? We see the addictions crisis across our province. Swan River, Madam Speaker, uh, cities and towns across our, our province are telling us this is a major, major issue and it's driving the crime rate higher in those communities and they are left uh, holding the bag because this government refuses to do anything about the problems that they've created until it comes to election time and then they'll say absolutely anything and they'll make these big proclamations oh everything's going to be fine we're going to bring in bill 34 and that's going to solve all the problems we know it's not going to solve all the problems manitobans understand crime and safety are ultimately there are root causes of those uh, those situations and we need to support people all the way through uh, to ensure that uh, this isn't the path that they go down. We need to support the communities once they, uh, you know, they have these issues, and we need to uh, to support our police and our, our prosecutors. So, you know, the, <laughs> again, the, the government is scrambling at this point. They'll do absolutely anything, and they'll say anything. And you know, I mean, I hope that the member for uh, that the member for uh, Klein as well. Kirkfield. Kirkfield Park uh, is paying close attention to the rhetoric that's being thrown around in this house because uh, when members use uh, use certain divisive language trying to get you know to appeal to their base uh, I'm, I know he's going to spend uh, some time paying close attention because he did say any kind of fake news he's going to call out. So the member for Steinbach better watch out. The member for Kirkfield Park is watching over his shoulder. He's paying attention to what he's saying. And we might even get a point of order uh, or a matter of privilege from that member uh, when he hears some of the language that the member for 
uh, for uh, Steinbeck continues to use. Because we know that this side of the house, we stand with uh, those in law enforcement. We stand with municipalities who have been asking, begging this government to do something, to actually act to make their community safer. And we stand with those Manitobans who are struggling, who have seen the cuts from this government, and who need a Manitoba government that's going to stand up and stand with them side by side as, uh, as we go forward. So we're gonna continue to do this, uh, that on this side of the house, and uh, we, I look forward to hearing uh, from Manitobans during committee stage in this bill. I think there will be some, certainly some good uh, advice, and uh, hopefully we hear that from, uh, from the public towards this minister. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member for Tyndall Park. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I'm happy to rise and put a few words on Bill 34, the Police Services Amendment Act. Madam Speaker, the Association of Manitoba Municipalities has long called on our province to review the distribution of policing costs. And we know that the establishment of community safety officers for use on Winnipeg Transit specifically was a pledge made by Mayor Gillingham. And this legislation is a step towards that and is very encouraging to see the various uh, levels of government work together on legislation such as this, especially when it's so important for community and province safety, Madam Speaker. In 2022, there were 130 assaults reported on transit workers, and many transit operators have reported feeling unsafe in particular circumstances. Madam Speaker, we hear stories every day, and I'm sure all MLAs in the House do, of people feeling unsafe in their communities. I know even just yesterday, I heard from some constituents feeling unsafe because their garage was broken into. A business on McPhillips Street was broken into last night, Madam Speaker. There's a lot of unsafe feelings that people are experiencing right now. And so anything we can be doing to help people feel safer, I think is a positive step. We do need to ensure though that those who may be on the buses in particular are trained to deal with potential interactions and individuals are meeting specialized standards, Madam Speaker. I think that, again, it's really important that we're bringing forward uh, legislation such as this because it is a positive step forward and something our province and I'm going to say our country as a whole and even the city has a role to play too. We need to be doing more to protect Manitobans. Justice is a huge issue. Crime rates continue to go up and I think this is a positive step towards that. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The question before the House now is Second reading of Bill Number 34, the Police Services Amendment Act. Is it the pleasure of the House to adopt the motion? Agreed? Agreed. Agreed, and so ordered. I declare the motion carried. I will now call second reading of Bill Number 32, an act respecting child and family services, Indigenous jurisdiction, and related amendments. The Honourable Minister of Families. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I move, seconded by the Minister of Municipal Relations, that Bill Number 32, an act respecting child and family services, Indigenous Jurisdiction and Related Amendments, Loi concerne les services et l'enfant et à la famille, champ de compétences autochtones et modifications connexes, be now read a second time and be referred to a committee of this House. Her Honour, the Lieutenant Governor has been advised of the bill and I table the message. It has been moved by the Honourable Minister of Families, seconded by the Honourable Minister of Municipal Relations, that Bill Number 32, an act respecting child and family services, Indigenous jurisdiction and related amendments, be now read a second time and be referred to a committee of this House. Her Honour, the Lieutenant Governor, has been advised of the bill and the message has been tabled. The Honourable Minister of Families. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I, the proposed bill will amend 11 provincial acts to recognize Indigenous jurisdiction support implementation of the Federal CFS Act, and provide provincial CFS agencies with more tools to better support all children and families. I'm pleased to confirm that these changes respond to many recommendations by Indigenous leadership and reflect long-requested changes from CFS partner authorities and agencies. They represent another step towards addressing the over-representation of Indigenous children and families in the child welfare system, while also enhancing services to all families in need of CFS supports. Changes to the CFS Act will include aligning provincial CFS service delivery with principles and standards outlined in the federal CFS Act. 
All decisions made under the CFS Act will be informed by an expanded principle of best interests of the child, as well as principles of substantive equality and Indigenous cultural continuity. This will ensure that apprehensions are a last resort, and when they do occur, placement priority will be based on family and community connections, reducing the possibility of Indigenous children losing connection with their culture. The existing critical incident reporting provisions will be expanded to include reporting on young adults, aligning the CFS Act with recently proclaimed provisions in the Advocate for Children and Youth Act. Other changes will provide a reporting exception for Indigenous service providers so that they will not be required to report a critical incident to the Minister of Families. This change respects Indigenous jurisdiction. Changes to temporary orders will allow judges to grant and extend these orders until a child reaches the age of majority. This will reduce the need to sever parental ties due to arbitrary timelines and reduce the number of permanent wards. The new suite of agreements will be introduced that will provide supports to meet the ongoing needs of a child and their family. These agreements will play, take place outside of the court process, that is, parents will retain guardianship. They will provide enhanced voluntary supports through family service agreements and new placement options through kinship care and customary care agreements. These new placement agreements create a supported pathway for children when they cannot safely be with one of their parents. They reflect placement priorities as outlined in the Federal CFS Act by emphasizing the importance of placing children with families or community members and taking into account customs and traditions of Indigenous peoples, such as customary care arrangements. A revised voluntary placement agreement, called a voluntary care agreement, may now be used if a child is in need of protection. Voluntary care agreements will only be used after all other options have been explored for a child to live with family, kin, or community. The foster parent appeals process is amended to allow CFS authorities to have the final determination on the removal of a child from a foster home. This is necessary to ensure that CFS agencies can move children to reflect standards for placement prioritization, placing emphasis on family, kin and community. Changes to the Manitoba Advocate for Children and Youth Act will align advocates' provincial jurisdiction and applicable Indigenous laws where they are in effect. Except in special circumstances where an Indigenous governing body requests a joint review with the advocate, the advocate is not authorized to review or investigate services provided to a child or a young adult under the CFS Act if an applicable Indigenous law is in effect or when CFS services have been provided under Indigenous law. The Court of King's Bench and Provincial Court Family Division's jurisdiction is confirmed and expanded to include matters arising under an Indigenous law over child and family services. This is only possible when enabled with Indigenous law. This means that if an Indigenous governing body does not want to have the matters decided through a provincial court, it does not have to. I am pleased to confirm that the judiciary was consulted on these proposed changes and have expressed their support for the amendments that will expand the jurisdiction of the Manitoba courts in response to the new Indigenous CFS laws. The Child Sexual Exploitation and Human Trafficking Act, the Freedom of Information and Protection of, Pri uh, of Privacy Act, the Personal Health Information Act, the Public Health Act, the Testing of Bodily Fluids and Disclosure Act, and the Victims' Bill of Rights Act are all amended to recognize an individual who is not a parent or guardian of a child who has been confirmed by an Indigenous <coughs> service provider or a CFS agency to be responsible for making decisions for that child. This will reduce barriers for such individuals when accessing provincial services on behalf of a child in their care. Caregivers who are responsible for the day-to-day -day care of children will be able to access health information and make health-related decisions for these children. For example, the important change means that a grandmother will be able to make emergency health decisions for a grandchild in their care. The Child Sexual Exploitation and Human Trafficking Act is further amended to allow Indigenous service providers to apply for a protection order for a child who is in its care. Finally, the Public Schools Act is amended so that a child who becomes a resident in a school division or a school district because they are receiving child and family services under an Indigenous law is considered to be a resident pupil. 
This means that an auntie, for example, who is caring for a child can register them for school even if they are not that child's legal guardian. The province continues to engage with several Indigenous governments who are at various stages of exercising jurisdiction, with more expected to come forward soon. These amendments are part of a collaborative journey, and we expect to make more changes as we hear and learn more about what is required to effectively support the realization of Indigenous jurisdiction of child and family services in Manitoba. I look forward to further discussions on Bill 32 and the support of this House in passing this historically important new legislation. Thank you, Madam Speaker. A question period of up to 15 minutes will be held. Questions will be addressed to the minister by the official opposition critic and an independent member in the following sequence. First question by the official opposition critic and a subsequent question asked by an independent member and no questions or answers shall exceed 45 seconds. The honorable member for St. John's. Miigwech, Madam Speaker. Uh, would the minister share with the House um, how Bill um, 32 will align with federal uh, legislation that's been recently passed and how the two would be uh, married or are they complementary or uh, is there some discrepancies in federal law and then with provincial law? The Honourable Minister of Families. So, um, Madam Speaker, uh, Indigenous law will supersede provincial law and federal law when they have uh, their laws in place. They, they will have the ultimate authority. And what the province is doing is just realigning its laws underneath our Indigenous law to ensure the, that we are able to, as the province, able to support um, Indigenous governing bodies who are inter exercising jurisdiction. Honourable Member for River Heights. Yeah, uh, to the uh, Minister, uh, we have uh, Pegwis First Nation, which has already taken over uh, uh, management and control of its uh, child and family services, but the variety of uh, First Nations across Manitoba are at various stages. Uh, can you explain how this is going to work with uh, First Nations at different stages along the line? Honourable Minister of Families. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Indigenous governing law comes into effect when that Indigenous governing body has uh, um, uh, finalized their coordination agreement. And until that agreement has been finalized, the child or, or children remain under the jurisdiction of provincial law. And so we are working with um, a multitude of, of other Indigenous governing bodies who are um, at various stages in their journey towards exercising uh, jurisdiction and implementing their own laws. But until such time as their laws are enacted, these laws, the provincial laws, will apply. The Honourable Member for St. John's. Madam Speaker. Um, so I guess to, to the, the Member for River Heights um, question, and also the, the Minister had mentioned it in her uh, comments, uh, that she was working with other uh, First Nation governance and governing bodies uh, in respect of, I guess, moving towards a coordination agreement. Could the Minister share with the House um, how many First Nations she's, the, the Department is currently working with? The Honourable Minister of Families. I will commit to getting that uh, ex exhaustive and comprehensive list to members opposite. It is um, a working document right now. There are several. There are um, probably 25 to 30 percent of all Indigenous um, uh, agencies in the in the province that are working on. Some of them have uh, collaborated and are uh, becoming uh, more of a uh, consortium, consortium and are coming together as a, a single unified body, um, and others are applying independently. So it is um, an exhaustive, or, or I will provide an exhaustive list, but I apologize, I don't have it in front of me. The Honourable Member for River Heights. Uh, yeah, my question is regard to the information system, CFIS, um, and to uh, how it will apply and where it will be used under uh, this these changes? The Honourable Minister of Families. It's a great question. And last year, I had brought in a bill under rather uh, hurried circumstances because we realized if we did not have a bill to share information with other um, Indigenous governing bodies who are 
bringing into law their own, uh, br bringing into force their own laws, that we would not have the ability to share information that was captured in our system. So we already have legislation in place so that just like an agency that is mandated through the province, any Indigenous governing body with jurisdiction will be able to access information um, in, the, in the CFIS system. The Honourable Member for St. John's. Uh, miigwech, uh, Madam Speaker. I remember that bill, and, and I, I think that was good that we all supported that bill to, to move for, uh, forward in respect of Indigenous governance and law over our own children. Um, I would ask the, the Minister if, if she's able to provide kind of like a, a synopsis or a snapshot on, on the process of, of a coordination agreement. Like, how long are we talking about? Do First Nations, uh, are, do they get dollars to be able to work through that coordination agreement? Order, please. Uh, as previously agreed, the House will recess uh, from 5 to 6 with one minute bell to summon members back to the House. And I would indicate that when we resume the question period, we'll have 10 minutes remaining with the Minister to respond. The House is now recessed. Order, please. We will resume the uh, question period on Bill 32 with the Honourable Minister to respond to the question. The Honourable Minister of Families. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. And in regards to how many um, coordination agreements have been signed, we have, as, as the House knows, one agreement with Pegasus First Nation who enacted their law in January of 22, and that there are two active coordination agreement tables, one with the Manitoba Métis Federation and the second with Island Lake Tribal Council. And then others, including a Pasquat Cree Nation, First Nations in Treaty 2 territory, to Tasquat Cree Nation, uh, Wabasi Moon, First Nations, and Broken Head, have also submitted requests to enter into negotiations. And it is anticipated that additional Indigenous governments will, uh, these discussions will begin in early spring. In regards to the other question that the member had asked, 
Um, I will um, uh, summarize by saying that we provided PEGWAS $11.35 million as they were entering into their coordination agreement for continuity of care. The Honourable Member for River Heights. Yeah, I thank the Minister, and I wonder if the Minister could provide a little more detail with respect to the agreement with the Métis. Um, we already have an organization which is focused uh, right on, on Métis issues. Uh, how will this change uh, the operation of that organization and of the activities? The Honourable Minister of Families. So if I understand the question correctly, and the member can correct me if I am misunderstood, but in regards to when uh, the Manitoba Métis Federation signs their coordination agreement, the Métis Authority will ultimately devolve f away from provincial jurisdiction and will be solely and exclusively under the jurisdiction of uh, the, the Federation, and they will, um, for all intents and purposes, have full authority um, over their child welfare for the, the children in care uh, that are currently under uh, Métis authority care right now or with Métis lineage. Honourable Member for St. John's. Um, Miigwech to the Minister for answering uh, those, those uh, previous questions. I appreciate that. Uh, the, the Minister noted that uh, $11 million went to Pegwes for the coordination agreement. Was that the process to get to the coordination agreement, or that is their funding? The Honourable Minister of Families. So one of the things that we were very concerned about is that there might be a gap in, uh, in between transitioning from provincial authority over to the, the IGB authority. And so we had flowed the $11.3 million in funding. In regards to setting up their initial um, capacity building to um, apply to, uh, for a coordination agreement and to actually um, write their coordination agreement and bring their laws into jurisdiction. There are um, dollars that are available for capacity building. Um, those are largely through the federal government, and I can endeavor to get information in terms of what those, uh, that allotment is. The Honourable Member for River Heights. Yeah, I wonder if the minister could explain the impact on the Manitoba Advocate for Children and Youth, because some uh, children will no longer be uh, under the uh, under Macy uh, unless uh, the, uh, Macy is specifically asked uh, to help from the First Nation or Métis, or can the child or family ask? The Honourable Minister of Families. We heard very loud and clear from the Indigenous leaders that we were consulting with, um, and I was very pleased that I had all the Indigenous uh, leaders uh, from SEO, MKO, AMC, uh, Sioux Valley, and MMF at a table to uh, contemplate these legislative uh, amendments, and they all resoundingly had um, supported the fact that the Manitoba Advocate for Children and Youth would not have jurisdiction um, over children that are in the Indigenous, uh, in, in, under the Indigenous system. And so they, uh, they will um, have the exclusive domain over child welfare, and Macy will not be invited to oversee that. The Honourable Member for St. John's. Uh, we could go on for quite a while actually asking questions about the coordination agreement and all of that. I, I do want to move, uh, and, and I, I am generally uh, grateful for the answers that I've received um, thus far from the minister, so I, I say miigwetch for that. Um, the minister uh, noted that uh, there was a table with Indigenous leadership, and, uh, but what we saw actually after Bill uh, 32 was introduced was uh, concerns that were raised by AMC's Grand Chief Kathy Merrick. And so uh, I'm trying to understand the process. Was AMC fully engaged in the process? Were they fully uh, consulted with? Because they still do have concerns with Bill 32. The Honourable Minister of Families. So I, I appreciate that we're, uh, the member's question and certainly do recognize that there, there is a lot of moving parts in this. And Bill 
uh, last year when we brought in the bill to ensure that we could share information with um, Indigenous governing bodies that have drawn down jurisdictions. Specifically, at that point, we were doing it for uh, Peguas First Nation. We, we did consult uh, not broadly, though. Uh, we, we needed to bring in that legislative amendment very quickly, and so it was not uh, done with the fullest consultation uh, that we really uh, hold as a standard. We did do that with this bill. The Honourable Member for River Heights. Yeah, I, I'm curious, for example, if there's a family in Winnipeg and one parent is First Nation and the other parent is Métis, or if one parent is First Nation and the other parent is non-Indigenous, or if one parent is Métis and the other parent is non-Indigenous, what happens? The Honourable Minister of Families. And I appreciate the member's question in ensuring that there is a continuity of care. Um, I can assure the member that the intake will remain um, consistent for most uh, Right now, all of the coordination agreements that we have either signed or are on the cusp of signing have got a commitment to continue to work together towards a coordinated intake table so that if a child is in need of protection or a family is in need of services, it will go to that centralized intake and then service delivery will be uh, administered from there. And those very complex questions that the member had just brought up will be sorted out at that point. The Honourable Member for St. John's. I just want to clarify, uh, and I know that the minister had mentioned Island Lake, but so uh, coordination agreements could be entered in with uh, tribal councils, or yeah, okay. I just wanted to make sure. Uh, also, um, the 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 uh, department. I know that the minister said that there were federal dollars that uh, First Nations could apply for in respect of you know building capacity and that consultation and all of that. Uh, but has the government, the provincial government, give any dollars towards that process, or is it simply just the federal government? The Honourable Minister of Families. So our government in this year's budget alone has increased funding to um, to agencies significantly. Um, the Southern Network, for example, is getting a total uh, additional amount of $18 million. The Northern Authority is getting $8.56 million more. The Métis Authority is getting an additional $4.7 million. And that is to, um, to, uh, to take into consideration several impacts, but one of them is also that we're ensuring that there is um, service delivery for the children under their care and understanding that there is a lot of transition in the child welfare system as we're all united in this transformation towards a better child welfare system. The Honourable Member for River Heights. Yeah, just uh, to follow up on the question that I just asked, um, do the parents, will the parents have any choice if you've got one parent who is uh, First Nation and the other parent who is non-Indigenous? I mean, w will the parents have any choice as to which agency or which authority or uh, they will go to or under which law <laughs> their child will be considered? Or is that totally at the discretion of the intake, uh, the combined intake? The Honourable Minister of Families. So uh, obviously uh, coordinated intake is very important and that is the primary focus of or primary uh, priority for all concerned whether uh, they be uh, lawmakers under the Indigenous um, authority or within the provincial system that a child and when in need of protection gets access to services immediately and that any jurisdictional um, challenges would be worked out upon um, or after the coordinated intake and so there, there will be um, situations that need to be resolved but there is a unanimous agreement among all service providers that these jurisdictional disputes not interfere with child protection. The Honourable Member for St. John's. So the minister will remember that back in uh, October of 2020, the uh, Brian Pallister had introduced uh, BITSA, and embedded in BITSA was the, the PC government's um, well legalized theft of uh, the specialized uh, or the uh, children's special allowance. So taking money that was earmarked and so supposed to go to Indigenous children in care and uh, goes into government uh, coffers. But the, also, we know that in August of 2022, 
the, the courts ruled against the PC government, saying that that was unlawful and they need to give that money back. So I am asking the minister where those negotiations are in respect of the millions of dollars that are supposed to come back to Indigenous children here in Manitoba. The Honourable Minister of Families. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And we do recognize that it was a shameful uh, chapter in the NDP history in 2006 when they had sent a directive to all child aid welfare agencies in the province that they must remit the child children's special allowance, the disability allowance, and any other remittances from federal or provincial governments back to the provincial uh, coffers to the Minister of Finance. That is a memo that was sent by the NDP government to all the agencies. Our government ended that in our first mandate, and when we were uh, when we received the ruling from the judge last June, we admitted we said that we would not be appealing that ruling, and we look forward to a very speedy and expeditious settlement for all children to to ensure that those kids receive the monies that they deserve. The time for this question period has ended. Uh, the floor is open for debate. The honourable member for St. John's. Uh, just to go back to my last question in respect of the uh, CSA dollars, and so we, we do know that the government has had you know, almost close to over a year now um, in respect of those negotiations uh, to return those millions of dollars. And, and from what I understand and what, from what I've learned, is that the first initial offer from the PC government was quite low, substantially, substantially low um, from what was taken and from what uh, Indigenous children are um, entitled to under that uh, ruling and certainly under the program itself. I understand that there was a second offer from the PC go government, uh, which was uh, somewhat a little bit better, but certainly uh, not what um, uh, Indigenous children, again, are lawfully owed. So I hope that uh, the PC government, I hope that they're going to, um, you know, ex expeditiously uh, get their next offer in to ensure that those millions of dollars get back that are rightfully owed to Indigenous children that are in care, that they get back to those children and to the children that they are potentially owed, uh, and to communities. And, and, and that's important. And it's, it's tied to Bill 32 in many respects, because Bill 32 is um, you know, creating, uh, legislating the infrastructure that Indigenous uh, peoples, uh, First Nation communities, tribal councils, can take uh, full jurisdiction over our children full jurisdiction over our lives and our families and um, repair you know, the intergenerational effects of colonialism. I mean, often we talk about the intergenerational effects of residential school, but certainly the, the CFS system is a, 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 is a continuum to that whole colonial history that, that, uh, that is Canada. And so those CSS, CSA dollars are a part of that. It is dollars that First Nation uh, children are entitled to, and they should get their, their dollars. So my, my hope is that um, the government will move quickly to ensure that they get those dollars. Because like, as I said, it is a part of you know, Bill 32 and every other, um, you know, hopefully type of uh, movement and progression as we move forward in respect of Indigenous self-governance. You know, I don't think that there's any uh, greater uh, example of self-governance than the ability of First Nation communities and First Nation uh, families and First Nation parents to be able to have their children, to be able to, um, by our cultural norms, by our cultural traditions, by our ceremonies, be able to raise our children, which has been for generations and generations taken away from Indigenous peoples. And I don't need to go into the history here, I, I suspect not or I hope not. Um, but, 
you know, my, my hope is that First Nation communities and, you know, any other agencies, tribal councils, who be it, or, you know, whoever would like to engage in that, are supported in that process. Because, and that's why I was asking about the support that First Nation communities get in respect of the, the coordination agreement process. Because so many First Nation communities operate with very minimal resources, and there is really a lack of resources to do this really important work. You have to hire people, you have to have researchers, you have to have consultation, you have to have people to write it up, you have to, pe you have, to have people to you know, um, meet with elders and families and all of that. That's, a, that's a, a lot of work. And it's a lot of work that is welcomed and, and certainly uh, want, wants to be done. But First Nation communities need the resources to be able to do that. And that is, in many respects, an act of reconciliation. When we understand and we recognize that First Nation communities need those supports, but if we're really, truly committed to reconciliation, and if we're really, truly committed to um, bringing children home and keeping the children that we have at home and protecting them, then uh, there are additional financial responsibilities in that pursuit. And so I, I hope that there's dollars there. I know that the minister, minister said that there were federal dollars, but I also hope that the, the province also supports that process in any way that they can. Um, I, I'm not going to say too much here. I just I want to say this. You know, so for so long, um, First Nation uh, communities, uh, First Nation leadership, but more importantly, uh, First Nation women, Indigenous women, have for been on the forefront of ensuring that children are taken care of, of ensuring that children are not taken from their communities, of ensuring that children are not put into foster homes that are unsafe and that are, are culturally safe. Uh, that work has been done by, by Indigenous women and uh, in, in the spirit of what is um, you know, our, one of our, our sacred responsibilities to protect our children. And so you know, any movement that occurs within these, this, this huge system, any movement that occurs, any movement that takes us further or helps for us to be able to restore um, our traditions, and all uh, the way that we understand as Indigenous peoples raising children and protecting children and centering children, that work can be attributed. Any, any little progression is the consequence of the work of Indigenous women. And I'll just share this quick story. I remember years and years ago when I was at the Southern Chiefs Organization, which I used to write, I was in, I was in charge of all the resolutions, so I had to, every time we had special assemblies, I was always writing the uh, resolutions, and I'd have to make changes and all of that. And there were so, over the 10 years that I was at Southern Chiefs Organization, there were so many resolutions in respect of CFS and bringing children home. But I, I remember particularly this one uh, Chiefs and Summit meeting that we had. And for the life of me, I can't remember where we were. Maybe we were in Broken Head, I, I can't remember. And a group of women came in, a, a group of matriarchs came in, and, you know, I don't think it's any, any surprise to anybody in this chamber that, uh, you know, the vast majority of the people that were sitting at the decision-making table at the time were men and, and still exist uh, today, that the vast majority of chiefs and council are men. And at that time, you know, there were very, very, very few women chief or councils. And I remember this group of matriarchs came in and they demanded to make an address to the chiefs. And I've never forgotten that because they, each of them took their time and they talked about the need to really dismantle the current CFS system that continues to take our children away uh, from us and from our communities and what that does to our communities. And they were so powerful and they were so um, eloquent and articulate and just, they just exuded matriarchy. They just exuded that love that Indigenous women have for their children and for the, for the totality of the community, for, the, for all of our families. And so, you know, when we're debating this bill here today, which, which will pass today, it will pass second reading, 
um, you know, I just want to pay uh, homage and, and honor those women that for so many years have been doing that work. Not the least of it, I, you know, I'd like to mention Cora Morgan, who was the First Nation Family Advocate uh, out of the um, AMC's First Nation Family Advocate Office, who has been there uh, for like seven years and has done phenomenal work. And for many, many years, like many of us will know, has set up camp in front of the legislative grounds to draw attention to bringing our children home. And actually, for the purposes of, of history, it's actually Cora Morgan and her team that really have kind of cemented that language of bringing our children home. They produce many, many different uh, reports and uh, ceremonies and community engagement where that was, that was the theme, bringing our children home. And so I hope that today or tonight or whenever this bill is going to pass at the end of the, this session, that this is in one small measure an opportunity to move us further along and ultimately uh, to bring our children home and to keep our children home uh, on our path to reconciliation and on our path of self-determination. Miigwech. The Honourable Member for River Heights. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, first of all, I, Manitoba Liberals welcome uh, the uh, changes which are occurring, which is providing uh, jurisdiction in Child and Family Services uh, to First Nations, to uh, Métis. Uh, I think that this is a uh, move that uh, has been a long time coming, uh, but it's coming as a result of the federal legislation, as a result of uh, this legislation, and I'm sure there will be uh, other steps as well. Uh, it is important in the transition from the way it has been to the way it's going to be that we are careful and that we are at the same time uh, cognizant of what are potential pitfalls and potential problems. Uh, I raised already the jurisdictional issues when uh, one parent is Indigenous and the other parent is non-Indigenous, or one parent is Indigenous and the other parent is Métis, or uh, because there will be different uh, laws, likely, in different uh, communities, in First Nations communities. One uh, parent is from Peguis and the other parent is from uh, Nelson House, um, which agency is responsible and uh, what happens uh, when there is a need to uh, support the family and the child. Uh, so I think it's important to get this clarified. Um, I think it's important that there be some uh, ability for parents to choose. Uh, there is now, and uh, I have had parents who have been under one uh, agency and then they have applied to be under another uh, agency or authority uh, and so there is that possibility today but I, I think that this has got to be a consideration there is language here which talks about consideration of the family and the parents as well as the child and I think that that is uh, important uh, the language which relates to ensuring the child knows about family origins uh, and uh, takes into account the child's ethnicity, ethnicity and culture. Uh, in a world where uh, you've got parents of more than one ethnicity coming together uh, and this being uh, increasingly common, uh, uh, I think I was seeing uh, some uh, figures for Winnipeg that there's something like 45,000 multi-ethnic families or uh, dual ethnic families uh, depending on how you uh, word that and and that this is uh, this is the uh, the province we live in uh, and it's a good thing uh, when we have bridges between cultures and children able to benefit from the richer 
or the rich cultural history uh, that is possible here in Manitoba. I, I think the, uh, there is a critical issue in terms of the operation of the central intake. Uh, because the way that the central intake is operated currently um, varies. And uh, if you're uh, taken in at uh, the Nishiwashi Cree Nation, uh, you will have a circle of care. And instead of the uh, social workers coming in and saying, uh, I'm here to apprehend your child, they are will say, look, uh, we've got these services, I'm here to help you. Uh, I think we need more of that. But they made the point to me when I was at Nelson House that although they have children who are in Winnipeg, it was impossible to use that approach for the children in Winnipeg because they went first to Anchor, and Anchor uses a completely different approach. And, and so it will be important to sort this out and, and sort this out before we get too far along and end up with uh, difficult um, and awkward and troubling situations. I, I think it is, um, it is important uh, when you're having a family and a child um, where there are concerns <clears throat> uh, that um, I've seen uh, an instance where a child was wrongly uh, taken away from uh, her mother uh, who was breastfeeding, and it took two months for the courts to decide that a mistake had been made and the child was returned to the mother. But that child lost two months of uh, uh, bonding with the mother, in this case, uh, and at the same time lost the benefits of breastfeeding because it became impossible when the child was taken away from the mother to continue to breastfeed. And so there, there are some really important timing issues and really important investigations in a sense that need to be done so that there aren't these kinds of mistakes made and so that we're not in problematic circumstances. When, when you have a child who is uh, uh, having a, uh, and a family which is having a difficult uh, time, uh, sometimes part of the issue is that you have a child who's got a learning difficulty or autism or ADHD and he's or she is tougher to deal with and it's causing rifts within the family and, and causing uh, uh, stresses for a mother who, particularly one who's trying to uh, hold down a job and look after their cho her children at the same time, uh, there are uh, circumstances where um, we need to have the intake agencies uh, not only uh, being helpful in their approach, but also uh, being uh, careful in terms of if you take the child away, uh, from one parent but not the other parent. If you uh, take a situation where um, you, the ch children are going to be separated from uh, one or both parents, uh, that you need to make sure that the investigation has been done properly so that you know um, which parent is abusive. Uh, it sounds simple, but in practice, um, I've seen situations where um, the uh, decision has been made that the wrong uh, parent was the abusive one. And of course, uh, that's ended up with a child being with the abusive parent instead of with the uh, parent who is not abusive. And it seems, well, that could never happen. Well, sometimes the abusive parent is a really slick uh, talker, and, and the non-abusive parent is uh, very silent and withdrawn, and, and uh, it, uh, it happens. So we need a level of care and attention uh, to make sure that good decisions are made and good uh, investigation and understanding of the circumstance is better. 
I think in uh, Nelson House, Nishiwashi Cree Nation, that uh, because the people in the social work team in the wellness center know the community and have uh, close connections with the community, they're able to make uh, better decisions than in a circumstance where you've got an agency which has no prior knowledge of the parents uh, and, and uh, then is jumping into a situation which is much more difficult to decide you know, what's happened and uh, what to do. So I, I think that uh, there are uh, lots of things which are going to be important to sort out. Uh, I look forward to this uh, transition to working with people across the province in making sure that children in Manitoba are well looked after and have the opportunities that they should have. Uh, I uh, salute the, uh, those in the First Nation community and the Métis community and the non-Indigenous community who have come together to uh, provide advice and suggestions in terms of this legislation. And I hope that it works out well and that where it's not working, that we can make adjustments. Thank you. The question before the House is second reading of Bill Number 32, an act respecting child and family services, Indigenous jurisdiction and related amendments. Is it the pleasure of the House to adopt the motion? Agreed? Agreed and so ordered. I declare the motion carried. I will now call debate <coughs> on <coughs> second readings. And we will start with Bill 35, the Education Administration Amendment Act, Teacher Certification and Provincial Conduct. If there are no speakers on that debate, I will then put the question. The question before the House is second reading of Bill 35, the Education Administration Amendment Act, Teacher Certification and Professional Conduct. Is it the pleasure of the House to adopt the motion? Agreed? Agreed and so ordered. I declare the motion carried. I will now call debate on second reading. Baby, do you want to? Who's the backup? Who? Where's Kelvin? Who's the backup? Why don't we do seven? Do seven. Well, the seven. No, no, no. Order, please. Order. The Honourable Minister of Economic Development, Investment and Trade. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I seek leave to move to the next uh, bill in the session and then revert back to this bill at, uh, at a further date. Time. Pardon me. This evening. This evening. Apparently, we don't have the ability to do that. The order has been set uh, previously, and uh, there is no ability for us right now to change it after 4 o'clock. So. I will just indicate that we will be uh, addressing, considering Bill 6, and we are just waiting for the minister to... Um,
I will now call debate on second reading of Bill 6, the Manitoba Public Insurance Corporation Amendment Act, and we will move to the question period. The question period of up to 15 minutes will be held. Questions will be addressed to the minister by the official opposition critic and an independent member in the following sequence. The first question will be by the official opposition critic. The subsequent questions will be asked by an independent member, and no question or answer shall exceed 45 seconds. The honorable member for Concordia. Thank you, Madam Speaker. What will this bill do uh, in addressing this government's ongoing interference with MPI? The Honourable Minister of Justice. Well, Madam Speaker, what a pleasure it is to be in the House uh, at this time of the day. Um, it, uh, it will do uh, nothing because there is no interference from this government at MPI. The Honourable Member for St. Boniface. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Can the minister just elaborate on how the responsible party is determined in the case of benefits paid to a claimant whose cognitive functioning is impaired? The Honourable Minister of Justice. Yeah, I, I think rather than um, uh, trying to give a detailed description of where an individual in an MPI claim uh, might find liability, if the member wants to bring whatever particular scenario he has in mind, to committee, I'm sure that officials from MPI would be happy to answer that. Are there any further questions? If not, uh, the question or the uh, debate is open. The Honourable Member for Concordia. Thank you very much, ah. uh, Madam Speaker. Okay, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I do appreciate Joe. the opportunity. <laughs> Joe. Joe. I do appreciate the opportunity Joe. to say a few words on uh, Bill 6 uh, with regards to the Manitoba Public Insurance Amendment Act. Uh, this bill, uh, as we know, brings forward three changes, three main changes. It expands the ability uh, to reclaim funds from people who have made fraudulent claims, changes the criteria for qualifying for income replacement due to an accident. Uh, only those with um, those only with only a part-time job or a job offer are eligible under this bill. It allows MPI to pay funds and trust to a person on behalf of someone with impaired cognitive functioning. We have a number of concerns, uh, of course, uh, regarding this uh, government's uh, uh, handling of MPI during their time in office. Uh, that's been uh, been well documented in the House, and uh, certainly hope to do that more as we go forward. Look forward to uh, to answers from the uh, the government with regards to that inter that ongoing interference. But with regards to this bill, I do think that there are some good changes and some positive things uh, that are underway. Uh, I do just want to take a moment to uh, to address the fact that uh, MPI is one of those crown jewels, one of those important parts of. Uh, the Manitoba uh, uh, advantage that allows us to offer, uh, you know, low uh, auto pack rates, uh, good insurance rates to Manitobans, uh, while as also a profit generator and also keeps that money here in Manitoba, ensures that Manitobans, um, you know, have high quality uh, car insurance while also, uh, again, uh, keeping that money within our province. It's an important part of again, that advantage that we have, especially in times of inflation, in times of pressures on everybody's pocketbook on a month-to-month -month basis. We have the ability through our Crown Corporations to ensure that Manitobans are getting a bit of a break and that life stays affordable here in this province. We have that opportunity and people certainly understand that, but what they've seen from this government is uh, a total disregard for that advantage, at least when it comes to uh, giving that break to Manitobans. We have uh, a situation in Manitoba where grocery prices are through the roof, where everybody's, uh, you know, is paying more at the pump, where everything is going up every single month and everybody has to pay uh, for these necessities of life. Wouldn't it be great if we had a government that said, we see this situation and we want to support Manitobans, we want to lower your Manitoba Hydro Bill, we want to lower your MPI rates. That would be one of the ways that the Manitoba government could actually make a difference. But unfortunately, this year, the rates are going up again, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Once again, the rates 
have gone up under this government and Manitobans have to pay more. Why do they have to pay more? Well, it turns out that there's gross mismanagement by this government of MPI and MPI isn't as secure and stable as the PUB would like it to be. So the PUB had to raise rates once again, and we see that as going to be the, the reality going forward, because as this government has uh, only begun to uh, reveal to the public, their Project Nova is a complete boondoggle, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The money spent on this project to date for no benefit to Manitobans is astronomical, to borrow a phrase. And, you know, Manitobans are starting to wonder, why am I paying more for MPI just to cover up and, and pay for this government's mismanagement and mistakes? This is the reality that this government is going to have to face when they go door to door uh, this summer and uh, they start talking to Manitobans and realize that this matters. This matters. A one-time check? Well, that's nice. What would be even better is more affordability and better supports for all Manitobans going forward. So this government has to go out on their record. Seven years, hand-picked board, hand-picked CEO. It is their mess now that Manitobans are paying the price for. And uh, they have to go out and explain that to Manitobans. I look forward to that opportunity. Look forward to, to the chance to talk more about MPI, to talk about uh, you know what we can do to ensure that MPI is strong and stable and that we pass any kind of advantage onto average Manitobans. That's what MPI can do. That's what our Crown Corporations were set up by NDP governments, I might add, uh, to do. And we will continue to protect those as the NDP here in this province. Thank you, Mr. Deputy right Speaker. The Honourable Member for St. Boniface. Thank you very much, Mr. De uh, Assistant Deputy Speaker. Uh, there are certainly merits to this bill in terms of expanding income replacement uh, around indemnity provisions to apply to victims who have a job offer or a history of, uh, or of a variety of employment types, which will uh, prevent these individuals from falling through the cracks in the case of an accident. Uh, the provision regarding the non-payment of benefits to residents of a jurisdiction other than Manitoba, if there is an inter-jurisdictional agreement, that exempts the corporation from providing these benefits does need to be clarified. Hopefully we'll hear uh, from some witnesses at, at committee who will be able to, uh, um, to uh, enlighten us on this uh, because there may be interjurisdictional, uh, we need to know what interjurisdictional agreements exist that would deny benefits to residents of other jurisdictions. And uh, you know, this is, we also, when it comes to uh, compensation, uh, there has been a lot of uh, controversy and talk around MPI over the last few years, whether it was related to brokers or auto body shops. Um, over the last three years, MPI has issued several rounds of rebates, 100 million and 69 million, and then most recently 312 million, totaling about 500 million. It does sort of beg the question as to whether it, some of that money could be applied to uh, the current, uh, or should have been applied or held back in reserve to pay for the uh, Project Nova. But uh, we're, uh, we're certainly in support of this bill, and we'll see uh, what people have to say at committee. Thank you. Is the House ready for the question? The question before the House is second reading of Bill Number 6, the Manitoba Public Insurance Corporation Amendment Act. Is it the pleasure of the House to adopt the motion? Agreed, agreed, and so ordered. I declare the motion carried. We will now move on to Bill Number 13, the Wildlife Amendment Act, second reading, thank you, of Bill Number 13, the Wildlife Amendment Act.
As soon as everyone is ready, we will begin the next bill. We are bound by what was previously agreed to stick to the order um, that was agreed. The Honourable uh, Government House Leader. Uh, I move seconded by the Minister of Health that Bill Number 13, the Wildlife Amendment Act, be now read a second time and referred to Committee of the House. It has been moved by the Honourable Minister of Justice, oh, seconded sure. by the Honourable Minister what, of Health. 13? That Bill Number 13, the Wildlife Amendment Act, be now read a second time and be referred to a committee of this House. The Honourable Minister of Natural Resources. The Honourable Minister of Natural Resources and Northern Development. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I want to apologize for the House for not being here, but I'm here now. So. Uh oh! Order! Order! I can't Order. Even call out myself. Um, I'm obliged to remind the House that no member can reflect on the absence or presence of any other member, including when that member is oneself. So um, the Honourable Minister does have the floor. I would encourage that Minister to, uh, to continue as he should have a moment ago. Mr. Deputy Speaker, uh, I guess it doesn't pay to be honest. Nope. <laughs> Order. Here we go. It is, it's my <laughs> order. Uh -oh. Order. Order. Members, we have a lot to do. We can be here for many more hours. Let's move along and get to work, please. The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. It's my pleasure as the Minister of Natural Resources and Northern Development to stand up today for the second reading of Bill 13, the Wildlife Amendment Act. This bill modernizes and aligns residency definitions for hunters and anglers. Until 2020, the different residency definitions under the Wildlife Act and the Fisheries Act was not necessarily an issue as each type of license was purchased over the counter in paper form and usually purchased at separate times before the season the person wished to hunt or fish. Since then, this government introduced online licensing purchasing to provide an easy 24-7 ability to obtain licenses. This year, this government made changes that modernized angling rules throughout Manitoba. As part of this new recreational angling strategy, residency definitions for angling have been updated. To continue our streamlining and simplification process, residency definitions are now being updated under the Wildlife Act to align with those in Manitoba's fishing regulations. This will improve and simplify the online purchase of recreational angling and hunting licenses. There will now be one definition of a Manitoba resident, one definition of a Canadian resident, and one definition of a non-Canadian resident for the purposes of buying one's hunting and angling licenses through one easy transaction. While the language in the Wildlife Act is being amended to align with the fisheries regulation, the changes do not significantly alter who is eligible for what license. The only significant change is that permanent residents of Canada will now qualify for Canadian resident licenses rather than for non-Canadian licenses. This bill also continues to promote the strong tradition of hunting in Manitoba by removing an outdated clause which prohibits Sunday hunting other than as authorized under regulation. Sunday hunting has been authorized under Manitoba's hunting regulations since the 1990s. Saturdays and Sundays are the most popular and available weekdays for many people to get outside and go hunting with family and friends. Removing this redundant clause in the Act helps solidify Manitoba's hunting heritage and continues to promote our world-class hunting opportunities. Finally, this bill also clarifies that Manitoba's regulations need to clearly distinguish between guiding services and outfitting services. While these services are treated separately throughout the statute, the regulation-making powers treat them as a single type of service. 
This bill corrects this oversight to enable more flexibility for Manitoba's outfitting industry and their Canadian and non-Canadian clientele. I look forward to the ensuing debate and seek all party support for this bill so that it can have quick passage through the House. Thank you. A question of up to 15 minutes will be held. Questions may be addressed to the Minister by any member in the following sequence. First question by the official opposition critic or designates. Subsequent questions asked by critics or designates from other recognized opposition parties. Subsequent questions asked by each independent member. Remaining questions asked by any opposition members and no question or answer shall exceed 45 seconds. The, the floor is open for questions. The Honourable Member for Flint Flon. Uh, I guess my first question should be a little cheeky that does the minister have a clock on his office wall, but I won't ask that question. So really the first thing I want to know is who all did the minister consult with before bringing this bill in? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. We consulted with the uh, Outfitting and Guiding Service, the Manitoba Lodges and Outfitters Association, on that particular change. The other changes were, I don't believe there was any consultation on them because they just corrected some, some uh, regulations in our department that needed to be uh, adjusted. The Honourable Member for Flint, oh sorry, the Honourable Member for River Heights. Uh, thank you. Uh, this bill deals with guiding and non-guiding uh, activities. Uh, it looks as if the bill is designed so that the, it will be possible for the government to specify that certain activities require a guide. Uh, can, can the minister talk about which activities are likely to require a guide and which won't? <clears throat> the Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, this actually sets to differentiate between outfitting and guiding, where it is referred to as one, uh, one in, in, the, in the previous regulations or act. Um, so services of an outfitter, they provide accommodation, supplies, equipment and connections with hunting and providing, and providing the services of a guide, um, where, where guides basically don't provide those services, just guiding them actually doing the hunting. The Honourable Member for Flint Flon. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, so, one of the things the Minister talked about was the uh, removal of the prohibition against Sunday hunting. Has the Minister's department done any kind of study to determine what sort of impact this may have on the number of animals hunted and will it put more pressure on some species that are already supposedly under pressure? The Honourable Minister. Change to take Sunday out of the regulations uh, is just that. Every, every year, hunting has been permitted on Sundays since the 1990s, so this will have absolutely no effect on number of animals taken or anything like that, because traditionally, they have hunted on Sundays. The Honourable Member for River Heights. Yeah, uh, so in, in reading this bill, it says that it the minister or the government has the power to require Canadian residents and non-Canadian residents to use the services of guides or outfitters when hunting any species or type of wildlife in all or specified parts of the province or when hunting under a specified type of class of license. So uh, coming back to the question which I asked earlier on, uh, what is the intent here in terms of where the government will be requiring that the individual who's got a hunting license has a guide versus when there won't be a requirement. For Members, time has expired. The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I, I think this, this bill gives us the power to regulate that should we want to indicate that a certain game hunting area maybe requires uh, um, guiding and outfitting um, based on a particular need. To my understanding, there's no indication that we're going to force hunters to use uh, outfitting services. The Honourable Member for Flin Flon. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. So, by the changes that are proposed in this piece of legislation, there are some uh, foreign owners that have bought property specifically in certain areas where they come to go hunting every year and they 
bring a number of their friends with them. Does the minister see any financial uh, impact for Manitoba if now these folks can't come because only the owner would get the exemption, the rest of them would have to apply for a, a lottery to get their license. So that could very well mean less people coming, which then could translate into less dollars. Members, time has government. expired. The Honourable Minister. Mr. Deputy Speaker, um, this bill has no effect on, um, on uh, whether American hunters can come or not, or non-Canadian hunters. All this does is change the definitions to streamline them between angling and hunting regulations. The Honourable Member for River Heights. Yeah, my question is, uh, if there's a, a lake which crosses the boundary between Manitoba and Saskatchewan, or Manitoba and Ontario, and uh, people are going out fish or hunting, uh, in that area, um, do they have to be very careful about not crossing the boundaries if they're uh, out in a boat hunting ducks, for example? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, I don't know how much fishing or how much hunting goes on on the lakes in the winter time. I'm not sure when the ice is there. Uh, as far as fishing goes, Again, that's a great question. I'm not sure, for example, Lake of the Prairies, it straddles, it straddles the border there at some spots. I'm not sure whether, whether you have a Manitoba license that applies in Saskatchewan. I'm not sure on that. I could check into that for the member. The Honourable Member for Flin Flon. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy Speaker. So it, this will have some economic impact because right now somebody can decide they're bringing six of their friends to go hunting because they know they can get the license and go, but with the new bill, they have to get entered into a draw, so they may not be as many people able to come, even though the landowner himself may be granted that exemption. So has the minister looked at any of that, and are any of the local communities going to be negatively impacted by less hunters coming? Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Just to be clear, this bill has absolutely nothing to do with what the member on the other side is talking about in terms of uh, who can hunt and whether there's, whether there's draws or anything like that. I think you're referring to the non-resident waterfowl plan, which is uh, not a law, but is regulations within our department. You're fishing. Are there any other questions? The floor is open for debate. The Honourable Member for Flint Flon. Well, I don't have a whole lot of comments to make. The Minister's asked, answered some of the questions already, and just for his information when it comes to fishing licenses, if you have a Manitoba fishing license, you better not get caught fishing on the Saskatchewan side of a lake or vice versa. And I know this simply because Flin Flon has lakes that cross borders and has, me personally, I've not got one of those tickets, but I have friends that have. So one of the things we wanna make sure, whether it's this bill or any other bill that's dealing with hunting, fishing, parks, is that we have a sufficient number of conservation officers to monitor it, to make sure that the rules are being followed. And of course, we all know that that's not the case, that we don't have sufficient conservation officers, even though this minister has added Order. to their duties now for various different things. Order. And I'm sure the member from Swan River will get a chance to stand up and say something. One would hope that uh, it makes sense and Order. It carries on in relation to what we're talking about here, but it may not, who knows. So I just want to make sure that the minister has actually done everything he can to make sure any changes he's proposing to any of these bills is something that's going to be a positive thing for the province, for wildlife, and to make sure that, that he understands the negative impacts of his department's inability, refusal to actually hire enough conservation officers to make any of these acts meaningful and able to have them carry out the job that they're supposed to do 
when we're running 30%, 20%, whatever the vacancy number is, it makes it hard for them to do their job. And so the minister's made some commitments elsewhere about that and so far hasn't lived up to those commitments. So we really want to encourage him to do that, to make sure that we're training, and not just training conservation officers, but paying them a wage so that they will stay in this province and do the job that we want them to do, not get the training and go across the border into Saskatchewan where they can make substantially more money, which is a failing in a lot of areas in this government, but we won't talk about all those areas now. There will be other opportunity to talk about them. So with those few words, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I'll cede the floor. The Honourable Member for River Heights. Uh, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, uh, uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, just a few words on this particular bill. It is uh, mostly sort of in the realm of housekeeping changes. Uh, I'm pleased that the Minister was able to clarify that it wasn't his intent to require guides. Um, although that power is there and could be used in the future. Uh, but I, I think that uh, we would have a number of people quite concerned if uh, you went around a wide-scale requiring of, uh, of guides for people to hunt or in some circumstances to fish. Uh, although uh, in, in terms of fishing, uh, on some of the northern lakes with the rocks and so on and the Canadian Shield, guides are actually a pretty good idea. <laughs> uh, now, uh, we're, from a Manitoba Liberal point of view, we're uh, fine with this bill. We'll support it. Uh, we look forward to any comments that may come up at committee stage and uh, it uh, moving forward and becoming law. Thank you. Is the House ready for the question? The question before the House is second reading of Bill 13, the Wildlife Amendment Act. Is it the pleasure of the House to adopt the motion? Agreed and so ordered, I declare the motion carried. As previously announced, we will now move to Bill 31, the Animal Care Amendment Act, the Honourable Minister of Agriculture. Thank you, I move second by the Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure that Bill number 31, the Animal Care Amendment Act, be now read a second time and be referred to a committee of this House. Sarah. It has been moved by the Honourable Minister of Agriculture, seconded by the Honourable Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure, that Bill 31, the Animal Care Amendment Act, be now read a second time and be referred to a committee of this House. The Honourable Minister. Okay, I'm going to read that again because I made a very slight error, and for the record, it has to be perfect. So, it has been moved by the Honourable Minister of Agriculture, seconded by the Honourable Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure, that Bill Number 31, the Animal Care Amendment Act 2, be now read a second time and be referred to a committee of this House, the Honourable Minister of Agriculture. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I think the applause will go on all night if I don't get started here. So, On behalf of uh, Manitoba Agriculture, I'm pleased to present Bill 31, the Animal Care Amendment Act as Minister of Agriculture. I uh, move that this bill be given second reading today because it is a great bill and I've already read that, I think. That's just repeated here. So the Animal Care Appeal Board is an independent appeal board created in 2009. The proposed Animal Care Amendment Act streamlines animal care appeal board procedures and powers to ensure animal care and welfare. The bill introduces greater efficiency for animal care appeal board in adjudicating appeals for citizens who have come in contact with the Animal Care Act. The proposed amendments reduce the burden associated with the appeal process. Uh, these include the uh, cost of animal care associated with seizures of the animal and appeal panel administration. The proposed Animal Care Amendment Act is an important part of, of ensuring regular and timely 
review of the Animal Care Appeal Board. This bill supports Manitoba Agriculture's ongoing mandate on animal welfare. The Animal Care Appeal Board was created to hear appeals on animal seizures and orders made by the director or the chief veterinary officer for Manitoba. Appeals can vary in length from three weeks to 50 days. The bill provides that the time limit for an appeal may be extended by the Animal Care Appeal Board. It also amends the Animal Care Act regarding collection of costs under the Act. The Animal Care Amendment Act provides that the director can register the debt with the court and the debt due to Manitoba can be collected via collection agency. Approximately one in three animal care appeals can be considered vexatious. Appeals are considered vexatious when uh, an application for the appeal is meritless. For example, an appeal is made even though the conditions that led to the director's decision has not changed, there is no reason for the decision to be overturned if there is no new evidence. Or the applicant is not able to identify what a reasonable outcome or decision should be. That is why the proposed amendments will allow the appeal board to dismiss appeals in certain circumstances. Circumstances include if the appeal request is frivolous or vexatious, was late, is subject to other processes, or if there is no chance of success of the appeal. This will save time and resources, as well as improve animal welfare. The bill also provides an opportunity for the appealant to make a written submission to the board before dismissing an appeal or part of an appeal. This is in the interest of the fair access to justice, who can provide one last opportunity for the appealant to be heard by the board. Manitoba Agriculture proposed amendments will enhance the hearing process by introducing electronic submissions of appeals as well as allowing hearings to be held by telephone or other electronic means like Teams, for example. The bill aims to ensure the appeal process is made more flexible by reducing the burden on an uh, appealant and parties involved. This provides added flexibility to the Animal Care Appeal Board by reducing the requirement for physical presence at a hearing. These enhan enhancements to the process will facilitate citizens' ability to present to the Animal Care Appeal Board. The bill streamlines appeal board procedures and powers to ensure animal care and welfare. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. A question period of up to 15 minutes will be held. Questions may be addressed to the minister by any member in the following sequence. First question by the official opposition critic or designate. Subsequent questions asked by critics or designates from other recognized opposition parties. Subsequent questions asked by each independent member. Remaining questions asked by any opposition members and no question or answer shall exceed 45 seconds. The floor is open for questions. The Honourable Member forgive, for Boroughs, forgive me. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I thank the Minister for the second reading of this bill, and I want to ask the Minister if there was any consultation done uh, for this uh, bill, and if it was done, who was consulted? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Yes, of course, on this side of the House, we're absolutely a consulting government. Um, I'll go through some of the list. I don't know if I can get it all through in this portion uh, of the time allotted that's left. Manitoba beef, Manitoba egg farmers, dairy farmers of Manitoba, bee, uh, Manitoba Beekeepers Association, Manitoba Turkey, Manitoba Bison Association, Manitoba Chicken Producers, Manitoba Forage and Grasslands, Manitoba Pork, and I would uh, like to table a letter in support of this from Keystone Ag Producers, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Are there any other questions? The Honourable Member for River Heights. Yeah, uh, just uh, interested in the range of animals, uh, birds, reptiles, which are covered under this uh, Animal Care Amendment Act. 
I presume that it covers livestock. I presume it would cover uh, pets, cats, dogs. Uh, what about uh, birds like emus and uh, parrots and, and uh, reptiles like snakes and geckos and so on? Birds indeed. <laughs> Sorry, my mic wasn't on. The Honourable Minister. The birds and the bees. The answer is yes. The Honourable Member for Boroughs. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, uh, and I thank the Minister for uh, the list that he just uh, read out and uh, support. Was uh, there any uh, opposition to the changes, or were there any other changes proposed during the consultation process that are not part of this bill? The Honourable Minister. Uh, none that we heard of, and uh, no. The Honourable Member for River Heights. Yeah, I'm uh, curious. I asked the Minister. Uh, this bill will set out uh, a notice of appeal must be filed within the time limit. What sort of time limits is the member minister considering? Uh, this is uh, particularly important in today's world when uh, information uh, circulates in many different ways from the internet to the local newspaper and it's often uh, more difficult uh, partly because of the multiplicity of sources of information to make sure that you, uh, you know, find out in time to make an appeal. The Honourable Minister. If the member would have attended the bill briefing, uh, as we offered, um, he would know that there are no changes to the time limit. The Honourable Member for Boroughs. I'd like to ask the Minister, how will this bill improve animal welfare in Manitoba? The Honourable Minister. Uh, it ensures a, a timely uh, response and uh, to get the animals into a loving uh, family for lack of a better, loving environment for lack of a better uh, uh, word, the uh, vexatious appeals can be dismissed. Uh, if there's no uh, perceived outcome or if there uh, is no new evidence. Uh, so they can be dismissed and then the animals can be um, uh, turned over to a new adoptive family. So uh, that will help, uh, help get them in a better environment quicker. The Honourable Member for River Heights. Yeah, I asked the Minister, could the Minister clarify the changes that are being made with respect to uh, uh, certifying debts and collecting costs. The Honourable Minister. Uh, it allows the, the Chief Veterinary Officer uh, can uh, register, uh, in, register the amount owing uh, to uh, in court um, and then they can be collected by a collection agency. I don't know if that answered his question. It was uh, pretty short, but I couldn't quite hear it all either. The Honourable Member for Boroughs. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, what sort of impact will these changes have on the animal owners in Manitoba? The Honourable Minister. Well, in some cases, um, a herd of animals may not be fed uh, and they're malnourished, and those animals uh, will be seized and that will uh, you know, get them fed. But the, uh, the owner of the animals, uh, quite often the uh, instance where they're malnourished is often an aging producer um, that runs into some maybe some uh, health issues. Um, so the, the goal is to get the animals the nutrition they need and ensure that they're healthy so the animals are safe. Are there any other the Honourable Member for Boroughs. Just curious if uh, some other organizations other than the, the uh, minister listed, for example, uh, Animal Justice or uh, Winnipeg Humane Society uh, were consulted during the consultation process? The Honourable Minister. 
I can endeavor to get the uh, the, the uh, critic a full, fulsome, complete list of everybody who was consulted. Uh, I don't have the fulsome list here. I just have the top uh, top 15 or whatever I read out earlier. Are there any other questions? Seeing none, the floor, uh, the time for questions is over and we will move to debates. The floor is open for debates. The Honourable Member for Burroughs. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, we are talking about uh, animal care, which is important. Animals, uh, we care for animals and uh, animals are very important. Uh, in our life, may it be farm animals or pets or kept at the zoo or sanctuaries. So uh, this is an opportunity to talk about uh, this important uh, topic in the chamber. This bill uh, amends the Animal Care Act and uh, the time limit for an appeal may be extended by the Animal Care Appeal Board. So this bill mostly talks about uh, the the Animal Care Appeal Board, because uh, it's focused. The Appeal Board may also dismiss a matter without a hearing in certain circumstances. Uh, administrative amendments are made regarding notices of appeal filed with Appeal Board. Amendments are also made regarding collection of costs under the Act. Treating animals ethically is very important and there must be repercussions for those who fail to do so. Bill, 31st, Bill 31 would change how the Animal Care Board hears and uh, processes appeals to make the process more flexible. Under Bill 31, the time limit for an appeal may be extended by the Board. The Appeal Board may also dismiss a matter without a hearing in certain circumstances. In addition, the bill will enhance the hearing process by introducing electronic submission of appeals, as well as allowing hearings to be held by telephone or other electronic means. The proposed amendment will bring greater clar clarity to Animal Care Act, introducing a more efficient way to adjudicating appeals brought uh, before the Animal Care Appeal Board. Uh, I do not have any specific concerns uh, with uh, what has been proposed in this bill, but uh, as per my uh, interactions with uh, a few Manitobans, uh, there was an expectation that a few uh, other changes or amendments uh, could be part of this bill. And uh, I just uh, wanted to share this, that I understand that uh, uh, a few organizations and a few Manitobans have uh, contacted uh, Agriculture Department and uh, the Minister uh, for their concerns, uh, especially about uh, the accreditation of the zoos and aquariums, and they have specific concerns. Uh, I'm sure that uh, the minister has received that information and concerns, and uh, uh, I, I expect that the department, uh, his department, would be uh, considering those uh, uh, proposals and issues and uh, work towards addressing those uh, issues uh, uh, to satisfy the, the people that are really concerned and uh, looking forward to improve uh, animal care in Manitoba. So with those words, I would uh, uh, just uh, uh, hand over the floor to the next person who is interested to speak. Thank you so much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The Honourable Member for River Heights. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, Bill 31, the Animal Care Amendment Act, uh, makes some amendments with respect to appeals specifically uh, and uh, some uh, uh, clauses relate to the costs. Uh, this is a bill which uh, we are prepared to support. 
uh, I uh, continue to have concerns with the uh, way that things are happening with the timeline for uh, appeals, that there is adequate notice and adequate time for people uh, who are uh, uh, served with uh, situations uh, where there's concern about animal care, uh, that they have the time to uh, prepare and put in that appeal. Uh, it is important in Manitoba that we're looking after uh, animals, and that uh, is the whole suite from uh, uh, birds and animals and wild animals and uh, livestock. Uh, this is uh, increasingly uh, important. People are uh, increasingly conscious of how animals are cared for and looked after. Uh, and uh, this is uh, doing this well, um, generates uh, respect for what we do in Manitoba, and so it's important to do it well. Uh, with those few comments, I'll look forward to uh, whatever comments may come at committee stage and this bill moving forward and uh, passing by June the 1st, probably. Is the House ready for the question? The question before the House is second reading of Bill 31, the Animal Care Amendment Act. Is it the pleasure of the House to adopt the motion? Agreed. Agreed and so ordered. I declare the motion carried as previously announced. We will now move to Bill 7, the Liquor, Gaming and Cannabis Control Amendment Act. Are there any speakers? Is the House ready for the question? The question before the House is Bill Number 7, the Liquor, Gaming and Cannabis Control Amendment Act. Is it the pleasure of the House to adopt the motion? Agreed. Agreed and so ordered. I declare the motion carried. The Honourable Government House Leader. On House Business. On House Business. The Honourable Government House Leader. I wonder if it's the will of the House to call it midnight. <laughs> is it the will of the House to call it midnight? Agreed and so ordered. The hour being 12 midnight. This house is adjourned and remains adjourned until tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. Have a good sleep, everybody. <laughs>